In June of 1864, the war between the states was entering its final year, and one of the main thoughts that occupied President Abraham Lincoln's mind was the part played by Rome in the war. Lincoln said repeatedly, this war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. This seems to be a strange statement by President Lincoln, considering what is taught today about the war between the states. Nothing is ever mentioned of a religious element in the war, or that the Pope and the Jesuit order were intimately involved. But Lincoln was not the only voice raised in opposition to the Pope's meddling in the affairs of this country at that time. Samuel Morse, the inventor of Morse code, traveled to Europe and Rome in 1830 to do his own investigation into the conspiracies hatched against America. After returning home to the United States, Morse wrote two books warning Americans of the threat from Rome. Morse would continue sounding the alarm throughout the 1800s and went to discuss the situation with Lincoln after his inauguration. Samuel Morse, of course, is the inventor of Morse code that was used for many, many years. And Samuel Morse wrote a book called Foreign Conspiracies Against the Liberties of the United States. It was published in 1835. And he shows in that book that the Holy Alliance and the Leupold Foundation out of Austria, controlled by the Jesuits, and the Jesuits themselves were the agents to overthrow the liberties of the United States, the Federal Republic of the United States, and to replace it with a papal centralized government as the Vatican is run. But today, one looks around us to see U.S. presidents and congressmen and women groveling before the Pope. Lincoln's words would seem ironic. Consider this also. In April 2008, the President of the United States, George W. Bush, rushed out to meet the Pope at his plane. Does this not seem to be odd behavior? For the first time in history, a U.S. President went out to meet a religious leader, or for that matter, any leader, upon his entry into the U.S. No President in the entire history of the United States has ever greeted a foreign diplomat like that, ever they wait until they're brought into Washington or something. They don't go out on the tarmac. Um, this is a first. What makes this even more egregious is that the current Pope is a former head of the Office of Inquisition and a former member of the Nazi party in his youth. You know that Cardinal Ratzinger was the Grand Inquisitor of the Vatican before he became Pope Benedict. You're aware of that. I assume other people are not aware of that. For a Jew, the Inquisition has such awful, awful memories, and we are inviting the head of the Inquisition to the Jewish state. I gave a lecture yesterday, and these are the points that I brought up. You don't invite the Grand Inquisitor to Israel. It's that simple. How did we go from a nation on the alert against the Pope and the Jesuits' desire to bring America down to one of accepting them as friends? Simply put, we have sold out. It has not gone unnoticed that several Protestant presidents have attended Mass and taken communion at Catholic churches. Since one cannot take communion at a Roman Catholic service if one is not Catholic, several presidents have misled their supporters into thinking they are Protestant when they are not. Furthermore, those in power are often Roman Catholics outright, so it is expected that they will obey orders from the Pope. From U.S. presidents to kings and queens to religious leaders throughout the world, those in power meet the Pope and bow down to him. Even when President Obama went to the Vatican in July 2009 to discuss the world economic situation, he too bowed to the Pope. Upon leaving, President Obama said, We look forward to a very strong relationship between our two countries. It is important to remember these words of President Obama and what they mean. The Pope is not just a spiritual ruler, he is a territorial ruler. 
the name of his country since 1929, is Vatican City. The Pope is a monarch. He actually, according to various books, uh, the Pope is the monarch of the world. Not just a religious leader, he is actually a political leader. The Vatican is actually a small area over in Rome whereby the Pope is the ruler of that small area. The actual name Vatican I found very interesting. It actually means uh, worship of the divine serpent. So we find that the, the very basis of the Vatican, the very word itself, means the worship of serpents. But from Rome's perspective, the Pope rules over more than Vatican City. He rules over the earth, both spiritually and materially, or temporally. According to the Roman Catholic teaching, the Pope can keep you out of heaven, and he has absolute authority over you on earth. And when I speak of the Pope, I speak of the papacy, that the papacy claims its two powers. Its first power is universal spiritual power over all individuals, that every person must be subject to the spiritual power of the Pope, that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, which is the doctrine of the Council of Trent, as reaffirmed in the documents of Vatican II of the 1960s. It's still in the books of canon law. And the other power of the Pope, which is the second key, as you see the two keys in the Pope's flag with the triple crown, Lord of Heaven, Lord of Earth, Lord of Hell, and the two keys, spiritual power, the second key is the temporal power. And the temporal power is this, that the Pope believes he has the right to rule the government, the civil government of every nation. That temporal power has never been denied, it's never been disclaimed. But there is no question that the Pope wields both swords, both a spiritual sword that the public sees, as well as a political sword, which most people do not see. So it is very interesting and unsettling to those who love freedom and the right to worship God as one sees fit, to see our leaders submitting to the Pope of Rome. Now let us revisit Lincoln's words. We have discussed the popes and the papacy, but what about the other group Lincoln mentioned? He spoke of the sinister influence of the Jesuits. Who are the Jesuits? Jesuits are a group of people that were raised up um, right around 1535, 1540. Their leader was Ignatius Loyola. They basically had two purposes. One purpose was to destroy the Protestant Reformation. Because as you remember, Martin Luther had appeared at the Diet of Worms in 1521, stood before Charles V and the Holy Roman Empire. And so the Catholic Church sought to stop the Protestant Reformation that Luther began, and they couldn't do it. And so about 20 years after Luther, stood at the Diet of Worms, the Jesuit order was created. And one of their purposes was to destroy every vestige of the Protestant Reformation, both in the religious realm, in the political realm, and in the economic realm. Because the Protestant Reformation not only affected the religious arena, it also affected the political and the economic arenas as well. That was one goal of the Jesuit order. The other aspect was to restore the supremacy and dominance of the Pope throughout the world. The Jesuit order has directed popes concerning policy, both foreign and domestic, since 1540, in particular, since the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent, indeed, it, was a sta it started in 1545. It went for the next 18 years. That doesn't mean that they stayed there for 18 years. They met in different places. But over that period of time, the, the various leaders of the Catholic Church and the newly formed Jesuit order would come together from time to time and discuss how the Catholic Church would respond to the teachings of the Protestant Reformation. Would they accept them or would they completely reject them?
So the doctrines that were being championed at the Reformations, the doctrines of grace, justification by grace through faith, justification by faith alone, sola scriptura, only the scriptures, uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, etc., etc., no baptismal regeneration, um, uh, that there is only salvation in Christ, that we do not participate in our salvation, it's not a joint effort of man and God, etc., 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 all the doctrines championed by the Reformers were absolutely accursed and condemned and reprobated by the Council of Trent that the Jesuits really oversaw from 1545 to 1563. It was an 18-year council in the town of Trent, Italy, and that is the foundation of what we call the Counter-Reformation. And the Council of Trent laid out the, the focal point, the direction that the Catholic Church would go for the next four centuries. Basically, at the Council of Trent, they decided that tradition and what the Church Fathers of the Catholic Church taught would continue to be the sole authority in the Catholic Church. Now, of course, there's other aspects of that, other teachings that branch off from that, but that is the basic sum of the Council of Trent that tradition would still rule the Catholic Church. The anathemas that they have come out with that came from the Council of Trent to destroy heretics, to destroy those who would uphold the Word of God, those still live today. That's correct. The papacy has not rescinded any of the curses set forth in the Council of Trent. In fact, the Council of Trent ends and says, Accursed be all heretics! Accursed! Accursed! Every pope has to swear to uphold the Council of Trent. And if you read the documents of Vatican II, put together by Abbott, it shows you right there that every pope must swear to uphold the Council of Trent, even though in the 60s, when they were calling heretics separated brethren, with that delusion and illusion, um, they still did uphold the Council of Trent, as well as all the former papal bulls condemning heretics and calling for kings to kill them out of their dominions, like the doctrines of Pius IV. The head of the Jesuits is the superior general of the order. He is called the Black Pope. The head of the Jesuit order is the Black Pope. The man who is currently there, he was just recently elected, Nicholas Adolphus. The Black Pope is the head of the Jesuit order. He is called the Black Pope not because he is of African origin, but because he is in the dark. We see the white pope, we see Pope Benedict XVI because he's visible and all the world knows who he is. But the black pope remains in the dark, behind the scenes, and so few people know he even exists. But that's why he's called the black pope and he's the one who heads the Jesuit order. There is an ongoing war against anyone who resists the power of the pope. And this war is directed by the Jesuits. This war is not waged openly by the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus moves in the shadows. They infiltrate and get others to do the dirty work of assassination. If armed conflict is needed, they use the army of one nation to bring a disobedient nation to its knees. The Jesuits would do that very thing. They were very intelligent. They're still very intelligent people. What they would do as they would infiltrate, they did it through economics, through the merchants. They would then come in, start teaching. They're, they were very wise people. They would then infiltrate not only into schools, but they then would infiltrate into local government and then rise up to higher government officials. We find that repeatedly in the book by Avril Manhattan called Vietnam, Why Did We Go? Where he talks about how they followed this exact plan throughout Southeast Asia. They did it in Japan. They did it in China. They did it in Korea. They did it in Vietnam. They did it all along the Pacific Rim. Well, eventually what would happen, you would have created Catholic cities 
where all the people in towns would become Catholics. Well, they would then try to put their Catholic ideals onto the major religious populace of a country. In the Far East, of course, the major religious populace would be the Buddhists. So these Catholics in these countries, these converts to Catholicism, they would try to push their Catholicism on their Buddhist friends. And when the Buddhist friends rejected it, the Catholics would start to use force. Well, then the Buddhists would appeal to the local governments, the state governments, the national governments, and then there would be revolution. It got so bad in Japan that in 1639, the, the Japanese emperor, he said, no more Catholics, no more Europeans will come to our island again. And that ban stayed there for almost two centuries. This happened throughout the Far East and in other countries throughout the world. Why has this assault on the non-Catholic world been ignored by most people, especially Protestant ministers? Billy Graham is not, he didn't protest or, towards the latter part of his life. For the first part, I think he was solid when he first started. But along around the early 60s, his voice was silenced. Robert Schuller, uh, Paul Crouch, um, Hal Lindsey, um, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, all of these men, they're not protesting. What they have become is are agents, agents of Rome. I remember back when I was starting my student teaching, I was teaching seventh grade history to young people talking about the pilgrims and Puritans coming over to America. The book said absolutely nothing about why they were coming to America. And I was just reading, and I've got a book here called The uh, Rothschild uh, Money Trust, and also a book about the Rockefellers, The Rockefeller File by Gary Allen. But these people have set up trusts, and they have rewritten the history books. They have rewritten the history books so that uh, the seventh grade history book that I was teaching out of said nothing about the reformations. We have to remember that the papacy, specifically the black pope, controls all high-level Freemasonry. That includes the pope's Masonic Jewish Zionist running his kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, that includes the top Freemasons in this country. Uh, the, especially the temple there in Washington, D.C. That includes all of your um, big evangelists. For example, Billy Graham is a 33rd degree Freemason. Now, I know the Billy Graham organization denies that, but it's still the truth because we know, according to the honest 33rd degree Freemason who was truly converted to Christ when he believed the gospel, was saved by the grace of God, his name was Jim Shaw, that when he was inducted into the order of the 33rd degree in Washington, D.C., he said there were two uh, former presidents there on that, uh, in that council, and uh, one of them was Gerald Ford, a 33rd degree Freemason, who pardoned Nixon, and the other was Jimmy Carter, a 33rd degree Freemason. So there they are at the Grand Council. Another one was an international evangelist, which he later said, told uh, others that it was Billy Graham because the publisher refused to put Billy Graham's name in there. So Billy Graham was there. So Billy Graham is nothing more than the high-level Masonic shill for the papacy, which is also fraught with Freemasons if you read the book In God's Name by, by David Yallop. And so we talk about Robert Schuller, for example. Robert Schuller is another 33rd degree Freemason. He went to Rome to get the Pope's blessing to build his crystal cathedral. And Robert Schuller is a personal friend of that, of the anti-white, hateful racist, Louis Farrakhan, who is another high-level Freemason who runs the Nation of Islam for the Archbishop of Chicago. 
So we have all these high-level Masonic leaders, black and white, of all these various different religions, working together for agitation among the peoples of this country, but never ever exposing the papacy as the true heart and soul and their, its real master. All of this sounds incredible. It becomes less so when one examines the oath of the Jesuits. We have to understand that these men have died to their own self-will. It's something a Christian should do. That's the way we should be. We have no life anymore. Our life is, we're dead with Christ and we're hidden God with Him. When Christ is revealed who is our life, then we shall be revealed with Him in glory. We need to learn to die to ourselves and count our lives as nothing. That our only purpose is to do the will of our Master. And when He's finished with, that, with us, then let us die. The Jesuits have done this, but they do it for the devil. And so they have completely been emptied of their own personalities and upon the order of their commander will do exactly what they're told. There's no such thing as a disobedient Jesuit. They're all under orders. They've been trained for 15 years. They're soldiers. They're more of a Marine Corps than the Marines. The Marines were fashioned after the Jesuit order. You break the man down in boot camp, you rob him of his personality, you shave his head, you put all the same clothes on him, they're all treated the same, they're treated like dirt, we're going to rob you of your will so that we can mold you into what we want you. That's all Jesuit. So, this is how they think. And given the order, they will kill you, me, themselves, their mother, anything they're ordered to do, that is what they will do. We're going to bring down 9-11 today, gentlemen. Okay, give me the order. What we do, what button we push, do I need to be inside, outside, what is it? And that's what they'll do. We need to bring down the Pentagon today. We need to blow up the Arizona in, in Pearl Harbor in 1941. Okay, I'll be there. What's my orders? They're all under orders. And this is why you can have no country with a Jesuit presence in it. They have to be expelled. And all their agents that they work through must be expelled. And this is exactly what Tsar Alexander I did in 1820. He kicked out all the Jesuits out of Russia. In 1822, he shut down all the Masonic lodges. And in 1825, he was poisoned. So this is the Jesuit mindset, and we have to, we should read the spiritual exercises. We should read some of their works. We need to read the Jesuit doctrines of regicide, how it's no murder to kill a heretic, how it's okay to lie, cheat, and steal, how it's okay to kill your enemy, how it's okay to kill a woman that you commit adultery with. If she should want to tell on you, you can kill her. It's all right in there in their canon law. It's okay to steal. The whole world is their candy shop where they can steal everything they can get their hands on to consolidate it under the power of the Jesuit order. And if that means killing kings or sinking ships, even if it causes their own death, they do it for the greater glory of God, ad majorium de gloria. When a Jesuit priest is elevated to a position of high command, he has administered what is called the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction. This oath has been called the Fourth Vow, or the Blood Oath, given to those in the Society of Jesus besides the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. A copy of the Extreme Oath can be found in the Congressional Record. I want to read a statement to you, uh, which is the Jesuit Oath. It says, this is the Jesuit Oath. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, that's from the spiritual exercises of Loyola, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope. I furthermore promise and declare that I will make and wage relentless war as I am directed to do to extirpate and exterminate Protestants and liberals from the face of the whole earth. I will neither spare aid, sex, or condition. I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. And then it goes on. The point being, throughout the history of the Jesuit order, they will shoot, 
they will burn, they will flay, they will do whatever it takes to destroy anybody who stands in the way of what they want to do. In 2009, the Jesuit general was confronted about the oath. Um, one of the things in your, in your Jesuit high oath, I think it is, it says something about, furthermore, you promise to declare that we'll, at the first opportunity, um, seek war at any opportunity against heretics, Protestants, liberals. What is that? See here? And that, that uh, you will spare neither age nor sex nor what, condition, what is, and I will hang, oh, yeah, waste, yeah, boil, yeah. flays. You've never seen that. this before? No, I've never seen it. Strangle, bury alive. Oh, and it's horrible. It's and I was like, oh, look, let me it's, just have it's in the congressional record. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Does the oath and activities of the Jesuit reflect anything Christian? Or is it as Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. What else do we know about the Jesuits? They have been thrown out of 83 countries over the last 500 years. That is correct, 83 countries have physically removed them. And why was it necessary to remove them? In a word, power. The Jesuits have throughout history sought to take over and control every country in which they reside. Since their beginning in 1540, the Jesuits' power grew until they controlled the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, and many of the governments of the world. In 1773, all of that changed. One by one, countries began to expel the Jesuits from their borders. This culminated in the suppression or abolishment of the Jesuits in 1773. In that year, Pope Clement XIV officially disbanded the order forever. This providential act enabled a nation based on religious liberty to be formed, the United States of America. At the same time in history as the Jesuits were suppressed, the American Revolution occurred. Many believe this was no accident, but an act of God. I see the suppression of the Jesuits as providential because without the suppression of the Jesuit order, there is no successful American Revolution, period. We have to understand that the Protestants and the Baptists of Europe had been persecuted in excess of 200 years, crying out to the Lord for some place to live where they could worship Him and seek His face and be obedient to His word that nothing else was more important to them than that. And so as a result, the Lord answered their prayers and opened up North America to them uh, in the 1600s, but ultimately to get a government that would protect them in their rights, the freedom of worship, freedom of press, freedom of conscience, freedom of self-defense, in what came to be the American Bill of Rights and then of course the U.S. Constitution. So without the suppression of the Jesuit order, there is no uh, escape for us out of Europe into North America to start a free nation where we can worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. As the Americans were determining and setting up a constitution where Protestant principles would reign, where freedom of religion would reign, where people would have the right to bear arms, where people would have a right to a fair trial, where all of these principles are being laid down, the Jesuit order is abolished. If the Jesuit order had not been abolished in 1773, and as they watched a Protestant country rising up in the Western Hemisphere, the Jesuit order would have used not only England, who they did use in the American Revolution, they would have used France, they would have used Spain, they would have used Portugal, because those were all Catholic countries. They would have used all those countries to destroy this growing Protestant nation, and it would never have been established. Having had their power and influence greatly diminished, the Jesuits were unable to stop the American colonies from establishing a Protestant Republic. 
That is to say, the Jesuits were in no condition to coordinate a crusade against the new Protestant Republic as they had done with England in 1588 by using the Spanish Armada. But the Jesuits had one ace in the hole. Many of the founding fathers were deists and Freemasons. They attended church services and publicly paid homage to the God of the Bible. But in reality, they did not believe in miracles or the divinity of Jesus Christ. Their God was the great architect of the universe, not the God of the Bible. Thomas Jefferson went so far as to create his own Bible by cutting out verses he agreed with and pasting them into a blank book. The verses Jefferson believed in were those where Jesus speaks of morality and loving others. Miracles such as the virgin birth or Jesus' resurrection were omitted since they were considered fables. Freemasons like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine had little regard for the divine, miracle-working Jesus of the Bible. Thomas Paine, author of the famous pamphlet Common Sense, wrote a book called The Age of Reason. In it, Paine says, Jesus Christ wrote no account of himself. The history of him is altogether the work of other people. And as to the account given of his resurrection and ascension, it was the necessary counterpart to the story of his birth. His historians, having brought him into the world in a supernatural manner, were obliged to take him out again in the same manner. Thus, when it came time to create a document that would unite these colonies into one country, the Jesuits had an idea many preferred. It was called religious liberty. The First Amendment to the Constitution would allow all religions to exist in America, not just religions based on the Protestant Bible. In the new American Republic, Roman Catholicism was allowed to coexist with the Protestant denominations, as well as the deistic Freemasons. But most importantly, the Roman Catholics were allowed to vote just like any other citizens. This was key, as we shall see later on. For as their numbers increased, Roman Catholics could put in power other Roman Catholics, or those who were sympathetic to them and change the nation from within. After the uh, Revolutionary War, voting rights of Catholics did change. Uh, we know that one of the signers of the Constitution was a Roman Catholic. There was only one, uh, Mr. Carroll. But nonetheless, it made it look like a place for Roman Catholics to come, as well as Protestants to have religious liberty, which is absurd. The Roman Catholic people had been used by the priests to kill us for centuries and so why not stay in Europe? Well they were being used by the Jesuits to come here to ultimately then take over political power and then submit North America to the feet of the Pope. Turning from the happenings with the American colonies let us take a moment to investigate what the Jesuits were up to in Europe after their suppression. As we might guess, the Jesuits were not idle. They decided to seek revenge against those who had turned on them, specifically a traitorous pope and the Catholic monarchs of Europe. In 1774, a year after the Jesuits were disbanded forever, Pope Clement XIV had suppressed the Jesuits. And uh, a short time later, he was poisoned. Poison is a big thing with these guys. Pope Clement stated, Alas, I knew they would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner. A post-mortem examination of his body revealed the presence of a poison. Thus, the Jesuits rid themselves of a troublesome pope. The vendetta on the Catholic monarchs of Europe was approached in a less obvious manner. Cleverly, the Jesuits determined not to act in their own name, but decided to work through front groups and to have them take the blame for their revenge. In this way, the Jesuits would continue to appear to be disbanded and innocent of any involvement in the matter. The first front group the Jesuits used was called the Illuminati. The Illuminati was organized in Bavaria by a Jesuit professor, Adam Weishaupt, on May 1, 1776, just three years after the Jesuits were disbanded. 
Many sources only casually mention that Weishaupt was a former Jesuit, and they usually state he was an ex-Jesuit. In reality, Weishaupt never left the order. As for the order itself, it never was truly disbanded. In Bavaria, when the Illuminati was founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, um, Weishaupt is used by the Jesuits then to continue the work of the Jesuit order under another name. Weishaupt never repudiated the Jesuits. That's a lie of many, many conspiratorial historians controlled by the Pope. They want to create this dichotomy between the Illuminati and the Jesuits. Never fall for it. Uh, Weishaupt was operating under orders from a superior, Ritchie at the time who was the general, then later another superior. But Weishaupt then enters into an alliance with the House of Rothschild. So now we see the Rothschilds, the Jewish Rothschilds, Red Shield, become the bankers for the Jesuit order during the upheaval we, are, we will know as the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. So this alliance between the Jesuits and the House of Rothschild, these high-level Masonic Jews, is very important to realize at this point because we have to live with it and deal with it today. Also, Bavaria is the stronghold of the Jesuits. There was a huge inquisitional torture chamber there in Nuremberg. Interesting that the Nuremberg trials of the Nazis would be held there. And the very principles of the Illuminati, the way the organization was run, it's the very principles of the Jesuit order, and that's found in, in Nesta Webster's book called Secret Societies. In 1814, Francois Charles de Berkheim reported on Germany's secret societies and stated, the oldest and most dangerous association is that which is generally known under the denomination of the Illumines, and of which the foundation goes back towards the middle of the last century. Bavaria was its cradle. It is said that it had for founders several chiefs of the order of the Jesuits. Through the Illuminati, the Jesuits sought to take over various powerful secret societies, especially the higher degrees of Freemasonry. If you study all of the different organizations in the world, whether it be the Knights of Malta, um, the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome, the Council on Foreign Relations, as you study all these different groups, and the Knights of Malta would be included in that, you find that they are like a buffer behind which the Jesuit order operates. In his book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, John T. Robison wrote concerning the Masonic Lodges. At this time, 1798, the Jesuits interfered considerably, insinuating themselves into the lodges. Robison went on to say, this society is well known to have put on every shape and to have made use of every mean that could promote the power and influence of the order. And we know that at this time, they were by no means without hopes of reestablishing the dominion of the Church of Rome in England. And with the Illuminati and the higher orders of Freemasonry, the Jesuits fomented the destruction of the very monarchs who had opposed them, beginning with the French Revolution and later with Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, the French Revolution was launched and waged by the Jesuits using uh, Grand Orient Freemasonry and Scottish Rite Freemasonry in England for the purpose of punishing the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe, taking back the Vatican Empire from the Pope, uh, tearing away the colonies from England, Protestant England, uh, they were doing several things at one time. Remember, the Jesuits are the great Hegelians. They can think along 10, 20, 50 different lines at the same time and coordinate them all together. So to understand what we do, we have to think dialectically. We can never think linearly. So the purpose of the French Revolution, first and foremost, was to punish the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe. And that they did. What happened? Why, they beheaded Louis XVI, the grandson of Louis XV. We're going to teach you bourbons of France who you mess with when you suppress the Jesuits. And then we're going to behead his wife, Marie Antoinette. And she was the daughter 
of Maria Theresa. She was a Habsburg. So we're going to punish you Habsburgs. You suppress us, we're going to cut off the head of Marie Antoinette using our Jacobins. And then you Braganzas of Portugal, we're going to drive you into exile using Napoleon. And they did. They had to go into South America. And you Bourbons of Spain, we're going to drive you into exile too. We're going to have Napoleon set up a little banana republic up here in Spain. And, uh, so, and then the Knights of Malta, how dare you kick us off your island of Malta in 1768? We're going to teach you a lesson. So they took Napoleon down here with his, with his huge fleet, took all the treasures of the Knights of Malta and took all their weapons so that they could use that in the invasion of Egypt, at which time the Jesuits used Napoleon to kill all the Mamelukes, the bodyguard of the Caliph of Egypt. So now they're waging war against Islam like they are today. When Napoleon's usefulness came to an end, the Jesuits had him betray his soldiers in a war with Russia. Like many of the founding fathers of America, the French soldiers were very nationalistic, and they would be a problem in the future plans of the Jesuits. After his defeat in Russia, Napoleon was forced to abdicate. Working in the shadows, the Jesuits made sure he was kept in reserve should he be needed. So Napoleon was sent to the island of Elba and given an annual pension of two million francs. Then, on August 7, 1814, the unthinkable occurred. Pope Pius VII restored the Jesuit order. The Jesuits were revived in 1814 uh, with the papal bull by Pope Pius VII, which brought them back into existence. The suppression of the Jesuits was to last forever. It only lasted 41 years. Former U.S. President John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1816 about the rebirth of the Jesuits and the danger they posed to America. Adams stated plainly, I do not like the resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than anybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? I have lately read Pascal's letters over again, and four volumes of the history of the Jesuits. If ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and in hell, it is this company of Loyola. Jefferson replied back to Adams. Like you, I disapprove of the restoration of the Jesuits, for it means a step backward from light into darkness. Coincidentally, the restoration of the order occurred one month before the first meeting of the Congress of Vienna in 1814. The Jesuits were deeply involved in this meeting. When the monarchs of Europe began fighting among themselves, the Jesuits manipulated the circumstances to bring Napoleon back for an encore performance, the famous Hundred Days. The monarchs gathered in Vienna came to terms quickly in order to meet this renewed threat, the Jesuits' careful manipulation of the events being played out like a chess game. Again, it must be remembered that the Society of Jesus never wanted to do away with kings. The Jesuits only wanted to punish those who had suppressed the order. In March of 1815, nine days after the Congress of Vienna ended, Napoleon led his patriotic monarchy-hating men to defeat by attacking the wrong spot of the British lines at Waterloo. The Battle of Waterloo was deliberately lost by Napoleon, as explicated by our great Southern General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson when he reviewed the battlefield. And you can find this in Dabney's great work, his uh, biography that he wrote on Stonewall Jackson called The Life and Times of Stonewall Jackson. And when Jackson went there, he said, Napoleon attacked from the wrong position. He should have attacked over here. And that's exactly what happened. Napoleon deliberately sacrificed his army at Waterloo so that there would be the least amount of true patriots in France to resist the return of King Louis XVIII into France, who immediately restored the Jesuits and restored the Inquisition. Having no further need of Napoleon, the Jesuits made sure he was sent far away 
to the island St. Helena in the South Atlantic. While there, he was poisoned and died in 1821. In his memoirs, Napoleon maintained his loyalty to the Catholic Church, but had this to say about the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. We have stated that the Jesuits were deeply involved in the Congress of Vienna. Ostensibly, this meeting of the monarchs of Europe under the direction of the Jesuits was for the purpose of reorganizing Europe, restoring the balance of power, and discussing the creation of a federation of Europe. According to author Burke McCarty, the Congress of Vienna and several other secret meetings were in reality black conspiracy against popular governments. After the Constitution is signed, Protestant principles are put in place in the United States. You go into the early 1800s, the Napoleonic Wars are being fought in Europe, in Russia, but finally the Napoleonic Wars have stopped. All of the monarchs of Europe convene in Vienna, Austria. The man who headed it was Clemens von Metternich of Austria. Russia was there, England was there, France was there. They all came there to Vienna to decide on a big problem in the world. There were governments of the people, by the people, and for the people that were being established. And these monarchs of Europe and the Pope himself, Pope Pius VII, and the newly formed, reestablished Jesuit order in 1814, they all came together and they said, if we don't destroy these free popular governments, eventually the principles of those governments will destroy us. So at the Congress of Vienna, it was voted that they would pursue the destruction of any free governments in this world. And in 1814, the one government that was the thorn in their side was the United States of America. Eight years after the Congress of Vienna, the same parties met in Verona, Italy for a second meeting to discuss the United States of America and the threat of popular governments. For posterity's sake, on April 25, 1916, Senator Robert L. Owen of the United States Congress entered into the congressional record the secret treaty of Verona that was signed by the monarchs of Europe. These kings of Europe, under the control of the Pope, called themselves the Holy Alliance. The first article stated, the high contracting powers engage mutually in the most solemn manner to use all their efforts to put an end to this system of representative governments. The third article gave special thanks to the Pope for what he has already done for them and solicit his constant cooperation in their views of submitting the nations. Now the Treaty of Verona was an agreement between the Catholic monarchies of Europe and the Vatican to destroy the concept of representative government worldwide. Samuel B. Moore shows conclusively that Metternich and the Jesuit order and Pope Pius VII, they all agreed that the way that they would destroy the United States would be by sending as many Catholic immigrants to the American shores as they possibly could. So thousands and thousands of Catholics were sent to the United States. Thousands and thousands of Catholic priests and many Jesuit coadjutors were sent to America to take over and destroy this government. The treaty was signed on November 22nd 
1822 in Verona, Italy, by Metternich of Austria, Chateaubriand for France, Bernstedt for Prussia, and Neselrode for Russia. After reading the secret treaty, Senator Owens pointed out that the threat under the secret treaty of Verona to suppress popular governments in the American republics is the basis of the Monroe Doctrine. This secret treaty sets forth clearly the conflict between monarchical government and popular government, and the government of the few as against the government of the many. Because of the Congresses at Vienna and Verona in 1814 and 1822, there was an English statesman who was at both of those meetings. His name was Lord George Canning. And in uh, Burke McCarty's book, called The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Lincoln. It says in there that George Canning warned the United States government as to what was going on. Canning was in contact with a man by the name of John Quincy Adams, who was a congressman at that time. He wrote to Adams, he said, the monarchs of Europe, the Pope and the Jesuits are planning to destroy America. Quincy Adams took the information to the president at that time, a man by the name of Jim Monroe. We know him as James Monroe. James Monroe took the information, wrote to a former president who was still alive at that time. The man's name was Tom Jefferson who was in retirement at Monticello. Jefferson wrote back to Monroe and he said, this is the greatest affront to America since the revolution. He said, we need to do everything we can to oppose and stop this holy alliance set up by the monarchs of Europe, the Pope and the Jesuit order. In his letter to Monroe in 1823, Jefferson said he did not want to pass up an opportunity of declaring our protest against the atrocious violations of the rights of nations by the interference of anyone in the internal affairs of another, so flagitiously begun by Bonaparte and now continued by the equally lawless alliance calling itself holy. America's response to these two Congresses was James Monroe's State of the Union Address called the Monroe Doctrine, where he told the powers of Europe, he said, you stay over there, you fight your wars in Europe, we'll stay over here. If you ever colonize in the Western Hemisphere, we will consider it an act of war. That was the Monroe Doctrine. But in our history books today, we read nothing of the role of the Pope and the Jesuit order to destroy America. Nothing is in our books today to that effect. But that's why the Monroe Doctrine was written. The Jesuits convened a meeting in Chari, Italy in 1825 to discuss tactics for dealing with the Protestant nations. Unknown to the 13 Jesuits gathered for this clandestine meeting, a young novice named Leone was in the adjoining library. Leone could not believe his ears and began to take notes of what was being said for posterity. An English translation appeared in 1848. What Leone heard was no less than the Jesuit plan for world domination and the destruction of heretics, especially the heretics in Protestant America. As to the Jesuit plan for world government, you well know that what we aim at is the empire of the world. As to their plan for working in secret, let us prefer a secret war, which though less brilliant is more sure to bring us the advantage. Let us shun too much light. As to the Pope, also known as the Vicar of Christ, we may say that God designs for extermination, like the Canaanites, all the nations that obstinately refuse to enter into the unity of the church, and that the vicar of Jesus Christ is appointed to execute these judgments in due time. 
has to Protestant and non-Roman Catholics who do not join Rome. We have, however, one source of rejoicing. We cherish at the bottom of our hearts this principle that whatever does not unite with us must be annihilated. That Protestantism must therefore be utterly abolished. As to the Bible, then the Bible, that serpent which, with head erect and eyes flashing fire, threatens us with its venom whilst it trails along the ground, shall be changed again into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. And what wounds will we not inflict with it upon these hardened pharaohs and their cunning magicians? The Monroe Doctrine was ratified in 1823. The Jesuit meeting in Cherie, Italy, took place in 1825. One year later, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on the same day. Both of these former presidents and defenders of the Constitution died on July 4, 1826. What are the odds that these two men, so critical to the birth of the United States and enemies of the Holy Alliance, the Vatican, and the Jesuits would die on the same day? The day they died was the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. Autopsies were not performed on the former presidents, and it was assumed that they died of natural causes. Another strange coincidence would be the death of James Monroe on yet another 4th of July in 1831. Monroe left office in 1825 and supposedly died of tuberculosis six years later. It should be noted that the symptoms associated with arsenic poisoning, difficulty in breathing, dryness and tightness of the throat, seizures, and burning pain are similar to those of tuberculosis. George Morgan commented on these strange circumstances in his book, The Life of James Monroe. Morgan states, As John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had died on the 4th five years before, Monroe's death added to the wonder as though a power aloft had taken cognizance of the peculiar patriotism of these mortal men and had translated them. Is it possible that the power aloft was not from heaven and was not benign? Perhaps this power was not looking at the nationalism and patriotism of these men with joy as much as with a vengeful eye, as the Jesuit oath clearly states. A Jesuit vows to make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet. Others have even pointed out George Washington's sudden death in 1799 as very suspicious. There is evidence that the Jesuits assassinated a few American presidents before the war between the states. The first president they assassinated was George Washington. He was poisoned with anthrax. One of his three attending physicians was behind that poisoning. Remember, from the day he took sick to the day he died, it was a mere two to two and a half days, according to Headley's great work, The Life of Washington. So he was murdered. Why would the Jesuits want to kill George Washington? Like Jefferson, Adams, and Monroe, Washington was first and foremost a nationalist and warned against foreign influence. He promoted a policy of neutrality and the avoidance of European alliances. Washington repeated his isolationist policy in his farewell address that was published in newspapers throughout the country. Washington wrote, It is our policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Besides this admonition to avoid foreign alliances, Washington loudly declared America should keep itself free from foreign influence. Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, I conjure you to believe me, fellow citizens, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake. In addition to these publicly expressed opinions, Washington had acted swiftly to put down the Jacobin-inspired Whiskey Rebellion in 1793 with 15,000 troops. 
instigating the rebellion was the French ambassador, Edmond Guinet, and the revolutionary Democratic clubs that had sprung up in America. Guinet and the Democratic clubs were linked to the Jacobin clubs in France. In her book, World Revolution, Nesta Webster states, these Jacobin clubs were organized by the Revolutionary Committee under the direct inspiration of the Bavarian Illuminati. The Jesuits created the Illuminati and were thus working through the Democratic clubs in America. Washington never realized he was taking on the Jesuits when he crushed the Whiskey Rebellion. John Adams became president after Washington left office. During John Adams' administration, war with Illuminati-controlled France was averted, but Washington made it known he would not resist a call from Congress to assume command of the army. Furthermore, Washington endorsed the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts that were designed to protect the United States from the extensive French Jacobin conspiracy. It is therefore no wonder that the vengeful eye of the Jesuits was focused on George Washington. After leaving office in 1797, Washington lived only two years and nine months. From the onset of his illness in 1799 to his death was a mere two days. As with Monroe's death, the symptoms leading up to Washington's death were difficulty in breathing, tightness of the throat, and burning pain. Washington was only 67 years old when he died. Like Jefferson, Adams, and Monroe, there was no autopsy with Washington's death. However, the Jesuits made sure they had a servant on hand, Tobias Lear, to carefully plant the story that Washington had neglected to take off his wet clothes after coming in from his day of riding about his farms in snowy weather. Washington had taken cold undoubtedly from being so much exposed the day before and complained of a sore throat. Lear said this even though Washington explicitly told him that his great coat had kept him dry. According to Lear, we are to believe that George Washington, who survived the hardship of a winter at Valley Forge and other severe winters, did not know how to take care of himself in bad weather. The more likely truth is that Washington had opposed the plans and schemes of the Society of Jesus and was assassinated for his interference. Other American presidents, both in the 19th and 20th centuries, who would run afoul of the Jesuit order, would meet untimely deaths. For instance, the short presidency of William Henry Harrison. Harrison had been elected president on March 4, 1841. He would serve as president for only 35 days. At the end of March, the newly elected president came down suddenly with an illness and died. Many thought this was the result of his long inaugural address, which lasted over two hours in cold weather. But Harrison had been fine after the speech, and weeks had passed since the inauguration. Why was Harrison assassinated? One only has to go to his inauguration address to find the main reason. Harrison stated in the fourth paragraph of his speech, We admit of no government by divine right, believing that so far as power is concerned, the beneficent Creator has made no distinction amongst men, that all are upon an equality, and that the only legitimate right to govern is an express grant of power from the governed. Like other leaders in the past, Harrison was thumbing his nose against the Holy Alliance, who practiced the divine right of kings to wield power as sanctioned by the Pope. Harrison was also unwilling to accept Texas, a slave territory into the Union which ran against the Jesuit plan of using the slave issue to agitate and divide the northern states from the southern states. Unlike Adams, Jefferson, and Monroe, the Jesuits did not wait for the 4th of July to eliminate the heretical President Harrison. Harrison was poisoned at the end of March and died on April 4, 1841. Vice President John Tyler succeeded Harrison as president. The annexation of Texas was accomplished in 1845 under the watchful eye of the new president. Another president who died suddenly in office was Zachary Taylor. Taylor was elected president in 1848. 
Taylor was a southern slaveholder who did not want to see slavery extended to any more areas of the country. Like Washington, Taylor was devoted to the union of the American states, was very popular, and was a military man. Another crisis over slavery occurred by the Jesuits in 1850. A compromise was being pushed to avert a split in the Union. Taylor did not like the compromise being worked out in Congress. On July 4, 1850, Taylor attended the groundbreaking ceremonies for the Washington Monument. He was fine upon returning back to the presidential mansion. Then he became ill after eating some raw fruit that some say was a bowl of cherries. A violent fever came upon him. Senator Benton commented that, the violent attack commencing soon after his return to the presidential mansion. Old Rough and Ready frustrated his assassins and managed to fight the poison for five days and avoided the 4th of July curse. President Taylor died on July 9th. The Jesuits removed a strong, unifying leader and replaced him with a more malleable president in Millard Fillmore. Fillmore signed the Compromise in 1850, just two months after Taylor's death. As the Jesuit agitation of the American states was reaching its climax in the 1850s, a trial occurred in 1855 at a courthouse in Illinois that would bring two fateful men together. These two men would join forces to fight the Jesuits. The first was a rebellious Roman Catholic priest by the name of Charles Chiniqui. The second was a lawyer by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Charles Chiniqui did not approve of the corrupt conduct of many of the priests he knew. These evil priests were drunkards, sexually promiscuous, and thieves, often stealing money and property collected from their parishioners. The priesthood in Chicago was very corrupt, morally and uh, every other way. They, I mean, they were drinking heavily. They would go on these retreats um, and take up a collection between themselves, put it all in a pot, and go out and uh, buy a lot of booze. And they also rented a lot of hookers. Apparently there was a lot of you know, sexual deviance going on at the time as well. And he didn't like that, though, and he tried to change it. He quoted exclusively from the Bible and his bishop just could not tolerate that. The heads of the Roman church wanted Chiniqui to ignore these illicit and illegal activities. When he did not, Bishop Reagan of Chicago and another priest by the name of LaBelle arranged to have Chiniqui accused of rape. Chiniqui needed a good attorney. An attorney by the name of Abraham Lincoln was suggested. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had a, a team of other lawyers under him. Right? It's like a regular defense team. Lincoln being one lawyer, uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen R. Moore uh, was another lawyer. And that was a big court case at the time. It was the most important court case that Lincoln ever had in his entire legal career, as a matter of fact. But it's been buried by the Illinois government. The trial did not go well for Chiniqui. The general feeling was that he would be convicted. Local newspapers of the time they speculated that Chiniki was going to be found guilty and uh, that was being broadcast uh, throughout the entire Catholic community at that time. Fortunately for Chiniki, a witness came forward for the defense. Her name was Philomene Schwartz. Miss Schwartz had been in Father LaBelle's house the day the plot to frame Chiniki had been concocted. Schwartz contacted Lincoln and agreed to testify. She caught the midnight train to Urbana and met up with Abraham Lincoln and explained to him exactly what happened. Once Bishop Reagan and Father LaBelle found out about the potential witness, they fled the city. The prosecution dropped the charges and Chiniqui was vindicated. As they left the courtroom, Charles Chiniqui was in tears. Lincoln says to him, why are you crying, Mr. Chiniqui? He says, your agents have, your enemies have fled and you're free to go. And he said, I'm not crying for myself, Mr. Lincoln, I'm crying for you. He said, because I saw no less than 11 Jesuits with the sentence of death on their face today in this courtroom. And know for a surety, they will kill you for what you have done. And Lincoln says, well, then let this be my death warrant. And he gives Chinookwee a bill for a mere $50.
And then Lincoln sobers up and said, it matters not where a man must die, but that he must die at the post of duty and honor. Chinakwe's words of warning to Lincoln would prove to be true. The conspiratorial hand of the Jesuits at work, a conspiracy to further their goal of a world under papal control. Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States five years after Charles Chinnoquay's trial. By 1860, agitation between the North and the South was so great that many of the Southern states decided to leave the Union over Lincoln's election. This agitation was designed from the beginning to drive a wedge between the North and the South and bring about a war that would result in the death of countless Protestants, clearing the way for the Jesuits to reconstruct America into a tool of conquest. Lincoln had no military background, and the perception in the South was that he was incapable of mounting a war to stop the Southern states from leaving the Union. However, the Jesuits had studied Lincoln and knew he would be a very effective leader. In his own way, Lincoln would serve the Jesuit ends. Those ends were, one, to kill Protestants who lived mainly in the South, and two, to undermine the Constitution, especially the doctrines of state sovereignty and states' rights. Once in office, Lincoln refused to accept the right of any state to leave the Union. He also refused to remove the federal troops from Fort Sumter under the command of Major Robert Anderson, who was a Freemason. As tensions mounted, the Jesuit-controlled Freemasons on both sides turned the standoff into a bloody war. It's no coincidence that General Beauregard, a Roman Catholic Freemason, fired the first shots at Fort Sumter, and it's no coincidence that a Presbyterian Protestant Freemason incited those shots to be fired when he sent down the Star of the West to reinforce Fort Sumter, and that was Mason James Buchanan. James Buchanan started the war when he sent down the Star of the West, that ship, to reinforce the harbor because the southern states had lawfully seceded. If we had a union of consent. And I would like to add here that the three states that, that specifically reserved their right to secede in their state ratification papers were Virginia, Rhode Island, and New York. And if those three states reserved the right to secede, to withdraw the powers, the specific powers they had delegated to Washington, then every other state had the right. So, the southern states had the right to secede, the north had no right to stop it. So therefore, an attack against the southern states who had seceded was an act of war, and therefore it was indeed a war of northern aggression against the southerners who had rightfully seceded. As the war progressed, it was obvious that not all was as it appeared to be on the surface. Time and again, generals on both sides made blunders and missed opportunities that would have ended the war sooner rather than later. The most glaring of these missed opportunities was the first battle of the conflict, the first Battle of Manassas on July 21, 1861. Lincoln had ordered the invasion of the South by Union troops. To stop them, Southern forces were moved into position in Virginia under Brigadier General Joseph E. Johnston and Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard. Beauregard had ordered the firing of the first shot at Fort Sumter, and his family was not only Roman Catholic, but also had Jesuit ties. During the course of the battle, the Confederate forces were beaten back until Colonel Thomas J. Jackson stood his ground against the invading Northern Army. Stonewall Jackson's heroic stand paved the way for the routing of the invading Union forces that soon withdrew towards Washington, D.C. Incredibly, the Southern commanders, Beauregard and Johnston, did not pursue the defeated Union troops, although prompted by many, including Stonewall Jackson. Johnston and Beauregard let the defeated Northern troops escape. If they had pursued the Northern Army, the South would have annihilated their enemy and ended the war in a few days. Along with Johnston and Beauregard, there were other Southern generals who seemed, at times, to be working against the South. 
Take, for instance, the legendary Robert E. Lee. It was General Robert E. Lee who ordered the disastrous Pickett's Charge at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863. Author and historian Bevan Alexander states, Pickett's Charge was doomed before it started, sending massed bodies of men across nearly a mile of open ground against emplaced riflemen and banked cannons was simply an invitation for destruction. Bevan Alexander goes on to say that by insisting on fighting the North at Gettysburg and ordering Pickett's charge, Lee had lost well over a third of his army and had destroyed the last offensive power of the Confederacy. It was also General Robert E. Lee who refused to listen to Stonewall Jackson concerning the South's overall strategy. Jackson realized that an offensive war against the North would result in the South's defeat. No matter how skilled a battle leader Lee was, he could never win the war by pitting the far weaker resources of the South against the tremendous economic and military power of the North. Stonewall Jackson's plan was to avoid the Northern strength, its field armies, and strike at Northern weakness, its undefended factories, farms, and railroads. Jackson wanted to bypass the Union armies and to win indirectly by assaulting the Northern people's will to pursue the war. Jackson called this unrelenting war. Lee never fully accepted Jackson's view. However, a Union general named William Tecumseh Sherman did. Sherman's march from Atlanta to the sea conducting unrelenting war broke the back of the South in 1864 and spelled the end of the conflict. Lee was the one responsible for the defeat of at, at Antietam or Sharpsburg when he left the, the what was it, the Order 191 there wrapped up in a cigar. It was found by Yankee generals. Lee was behind that. Lee was behind not allowing Jackson to win at least four decisive battles against the Union forces. And this is uh, spoken of and written very well in Bevan Alexander's great work, Lost Victories. It is also worthy to note this picture of Robert E. Lee at the age of 38 with his son. Lee is displaying a mason sign called the Hidden Hand. Compare that picture with these pictures. All display the same Masonic gesture. That the Jesuits had infiltrated Freemasonry in the late 1700s and had taken control of the leadership of this secret society was unknown to Freemasons serving in both the Northern and Southern armies. Essentially, all Freemasons were serving the Jesuits and the Pope. Besides Lee's inactions and blunders on the battlefield, as well as those of other Confederate generals, a case can be made that the South's greatest general, Stonewall Jackson, was murdered during the four-day Battle of Chancellorsville, Lee being an accomplice. Jackson brings forth his plan to Lee how to flank Hooker's army and then we can attack him from the rear. And Lee says, well, go ahead. Instead of saying, praise God, yes, if we can defeat Hooker, we can then march across the Potomac to Washington, because that's all it would have taken. We were this close to keeping our liberty. But because Lee is in cahoots with Hooker, and there are Jesuits who are observers on the battlefield, as they were at Gettysburg. An arrangement is made between Lee and A.P. Hill because A.P. Hill hated Jackson's guts. Jackson had A.P. Hill arrested. This is General A.P. Hill. General Jackson had General A.P. Hill arrested for insubordination. And Hill hated him for it. And so this was Hill's chance to get back. So Hill happens to have a subordinate general underneath him who then will be used to fire upon Jackson. So Jackson, as he arranges his, his soldiers, as they've flanked Hooker, and he tells them, whatever you do, do not stop. You go, you march right through the federal camp. Well, what happens is, A.P. Hill's general stops, stops the whole movement. And so everything is almost thrown in disarray, and finally this guy's convinced, let's just keep going on. So by this time, they're losing valuable time. Still, it was a rout, but it wasn't a defeat like it could have been. And Jackson realizes that something's very wrong. He is now betrayed by A.P. Hill. 
and he's betrayed by this other subordinate. So in the evening, Jackson is reconnoitering, trying to see what should be done, and he's fired upon by his own troops. And I show in my book that it was a conspiracy because some of the people there, Jackson didn't know who they were. They were Confederate officers, and Jackson never seen them before. So <clears throat> Jackson is wounded, but it's not mortal. He's bleeding, but he's, and he's bleeding severely. But what happens is that Major McGuire, the doctor, is called to his assistance. Well, the doctor then takes him out, off the way from the battlefield and amputates the arm and uh, his left arm. And Jackson is uh, beginning to recover, but Lee orders him to be taken away from the battlefield by this doctor. And Jackson said, our men need our doctor. Why deprive our, our hurting, dying men of this valuable doctor? I'm getting better. But oh no, Lee gives the order to go to Guinea Station, take Jackson with you. And so Jackson is being taken there and he's beginning to recover and he's talking to the doctor, when can I get back and so on. Well, the doctor gets him to Guinea Station and takes Jackson, takes him away from the main house and takes him out to this little shack where only the doctor and he are allowed to be. And it's there that this dirty Freemason, Hunter McGuire, poisons Jackson, I believe, on about a Wednesday or Thursday. And then Jackson's wife is able to come and she sees him, but, but Jackson's not well. His, his, his arm is it's the famous picture of him where he's had his arm amputated, but you really don't see it. It's, it's the, the sleeve is still there. And, but he's been poisoned for the first time. And then Friday or Saturday, he's given the final poisoning and he can't survive. And so the doctor poisons him and his wife is pleading, his wife Julia is pleading for him, doctor, isn't there any more you can do for him? And so he dies. And with the death of Jackson, the poisoning of Jackson, then this very same wicked Hunter McGuire poisons Jackson's right-hand man, who's also a preacher, Sandy Pendleton, Colonel Pendleton. He poisoned him too. So the Jesuits are busy using this doctor to get rid of the true Southern Confederate leadership, Lee being a party to all of this. Like many others, Stonewall Jackson was getting in the way of Jesuit plans and had to be eliminated. At this point, we should take note of a man by the name of James Clark. Clark graduated from West Point in 1829. After graduation, Clark was assigned to Louisiana. After a year of service, James Clark resigned his commission and converted to Catholicism. In 1844, Clark would become the first West Point graduate to join the Jesuits. Clark went on to teach mathematics and science at Georgetown University, and he became the president of Holy Cross. It was said that Clark took a lively interest in the doings of his former classmates. And just who were his former classmates? None other than Robert E. Lee and Joseph E. Johnston. One can also include Jefferson Davis in this list, since Davis graduated a year ahead of Clark. It can only be guessed as to what communications these former West Point graduates had with each other. But that a Jesuit was in communication with Lee, Johnston, and Davis during the period of the war between the states is surprising and somewhat shocking. And what is even more shocking were the activities of Confederate President Jefferson Davis in 1863. Protestant Jefferson Davis began corresponding with the Roman Catholic Pope. Pope Pius IX, who was completely in the hands of the Jesuit order at this time, because he was not in their hands when he first became Pope, he writes a letter to Jefferson Davis acknowledging him as the President of the United States. After the Battle of Gettysburg, there was a lot of correspondence that took place between the Davis government and the Vatican, the Davis government appealing to the Pope for official help and recognition, which Pope Pius IX eventually did give him. Davis was no stranger to Roman Catholicism. He had entered the Dominican-operated College of St. Thomas Aquinas near Springfield, Kentucky for two years. He was the only Protestant student at the school. Interestingly enough, the young Davis sought to become a Catholic, but was encouraged to remain Protestant. One must ask why would the Roman Catholic Church turn down a convert? 
did the Roman Church have plans for Davis that would be better served with him remaining a Protestant? After the war, Davis was sent a portrait of the Pope. Such a gift, said a great niece, was never before conferred on any but crowned heads. General Lee also had his own picture of Pope Pius IX, noting that the Pope was the only sovereign in Europe who recognized our poor confederacy. Such was the attitude of these leaders of the confederacy. Men who were easily fooled or who were willingly playing along with the Jesuits' plan. It was these men who led the Protestants of the South into a war that they had no intention of winning. Shades of Korea, Vietnam, and the Gulf Wars come to mind. It should be remembered that for all of its posturing and open statements of support for the South, the papacy was really not on the South side at all. The open but false policy of Rome was that the Pope was on the side of the South. And Chinoque falls for this little delusion in his book, unfortunately. The secret but true policy of Rome was that Rome was completely on the side of the radical Red Republicans in the North. Stevens, Sumner, Bingham, uh, the list goes on and on. So, because of this, the Jesuits made a show that they were behind the South to create more animosity on the uh, part of the Northern Protestants against the Southerners of the South, because the Pope's against us by siding with the South. When in fact, we wanted the utter annihilation of the Southern Protestants. Now let us turn our attention to the Union Army. What was true with the Southern generals, Lincoln, to his dismay, discovered was also true with his Northern generals. They had allegiances to others besides the Union and Lincoln. General George McClellan failed to employ his vastly superior forces to defeat Confederate General Lee on numerous occasions, the most famous of which was at the Battle of Antietam. Historian James M. McPherson has pointed out that the two corps of troops McClellan kept in reserve were in fact larger than Lee's entire force. The reason for McClellan's reluctance to put his reserve into the fight was that, as in previous battles, he was convinced he was outnumbered. It should also be pointed out that McClellan was a Freemason. The question has to be asked, who was McClellan really listening to, Lincoln or the Jesuit superior general? Earlier, we noted General Lee's disastrous orders to General Pickett at the Battle of Gettysburg. At the same battle, Union General George Meade allowed General Lee to escape. Meade was a Roman Catholic. And after Gettysburg, uh, Lee is allowed to escape because a Jesuit then rides into the camp of Roman Catholic General Meade. And Roman Catholic Meade refuses to pursue Lee's army and captures only one gun. When the South could have been defeated right then and there, and there would not have been the rape, pillage, and plunder from 1863 to 65. There would not have been the destruction of General Sherman from Atlanta to Savannah. There wouldn't have been the burning down of Protestant Columbia. The, the, the four Protestant states of the South that were to be destroyed and plundered were Georgia, North and South Carolina, and Virginia. Those are the states that were plundered. New Orleans, well, New Orleans was under Butler the Beast, but Roman Catholic Louisiana was not persecuted. But it was those four key Protestant southern states that were made war upon. That would not have happened had Lee not been allowed to escape. And Chinoquie writes of this in his book, when the Jesuit rode into the camp and spoke to Meade. So it was a war against the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Baptist people of the South, perpetrated by not only the generals of the North, Grant and Sheridan and Sherman and all those, all those despicable criminals with their federal banditti and their Roman Catholic Irishmen that they brought over here to steal everything they could steal off the southern plantations and to rape the black southern women that were slaves. It was a general rapine so bad that many of the black men took their women into the swamps and to deliver them from this Yankee pillage. It was a it was a complete and total grand theft and larceny of the Southern people. In spite of the treacherous behavior on both sides, on April 9, 1865, 
General Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate army to General Ulysses S. Grant at the village of Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Two days later, on April 11th, Lincoln made a speech discussing post-war America. In the speech, Lincoln spoke in a conciliatory manner toward the southern states. Let us all join in doing the acts necessary to restoring the proper practical relations between these states and the Union, they never having been out of it. These words, taken with the amnesty for all Southerners that Lincoln had proclaimed in November of 1863, show us that the President was not looking for further reprisals or punishments against the South. However, Rome and the Holy Alliance wanted no amnesty for the South. And going back to the hated Constitution with states' rights and freedoms derived from the Bible. Lincoln had served his purpose. It was time for his removal. Lincoln was a useful tool thinking he was actually saving the Union because he wanted to restore the southern states on the same footing they had left the Union which would have frustrated the purposes of the Jesuit order by making a consolidated empire out of all the states. To ensure total chaos, the Jesuits decided Lincoln would not be the only target. So they came up with this, uh, this plan to assassinate not just Abraham Lincoln, but the entire government. The South had lost the Civil War, so they were going to take out Abraham Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, the head of the Northern Army, Ulysses S. Grant, and the Secretary of the State, William Seward, all in one night. On April 14, 1865, only five days after Lee's surrender, the conspirators struck. Abraham Lincoln was shot while watching a play at Ford's Theater. He died the next morning, April 15, at 7.22 a.m. Secretary of State Seward was attacked at his home. The assassin, Louis Payne, repeatedly stabbed Seward and escaped. Miraculously, Seward recovered from his wounds. Vice President Johnson's assassin, George Atzelrod, lost his nerve at the last minute and fled the scene. And General Grant avoided his assassin by leaving town earlier in the day to check on a sick friend. But who were these assassins? Most people know about John Wilkes Booth the man who pulled the trigger and killed Lincoln. But few realize that most of the conspirators were Roman Catholic. Even Booth had converted to Catholicism. It's clear that John Wilkes Booth, while he was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle, at the time he was plotting Lincoln's assassination, he was also meeting in the home of a very devout Roman Catholic woman by the name of Mary Surratt right in Washington, D.C., and it was in her home that the plot to kill Lincoln was hatched. The Jesuits of Washington, D.C. put together the plot for the assassination. The Jesuit of power behind that plot was Bernadine F. Wiggett. Jesuits under the stream of an induction, they were not directly to be involved. They only were the... Uh, the uh, the elements, the intellectual uh, element that will prepare this, the case of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the president, uh, was uh, killed by the Jesuit of Rome, but there was no a Jesuit there involved directly. Nevertheless, it was the Jesuit who prepared the plot against his life and prepared and trained those who were to kill him. They arranged it. Yes. To be sure, the assassins were also Southerners, but they were first and foremost Jesuit assassins and agents of the foreign dictator called the Pope. Among the conspirators was Mary Surratt's son, John Surratt. His tale leads to the very doors of the Papal Palace in Rome. Four of them were eventually hung and the rest were sent to prison for various lengths of time. Booth was killed in a barn, but the story around Surratt is absolutely amazing. Surratt, after the assassination, John Surratt escaped to, uh, to Canada. Now the southern government had a kitchen cabinet based in Montreal. So that's the first place he went was to Montreal. And who's in Montreal to meet this, this uh, Surratt was two priests. And they squirreled him away for about six months. At the same time, the government is looking 
all over for this guy. It's like the biggest manhunt in U.S. history, and they can't find him. Um, and uh, so, and here he is sitting in a in a uh, a little town outside of Montreal, uh, being protected by priests. The Jesuits were behind this assassination. They controlled Surratt. Surratt called time outside of Ford's Theater. Uh, John Wilkes Booth uh, does the shooting. The, the guard, the Secret Service guard, who's supposedly supposing to be guarding the entranceway to the booth of Lincoln, he just happens to leave his post. And he's never punished for it. Uh, so the assassination takes place. Uh, Surratt escapes to Canada. He's taken to Liverpool. He's taken from there to Rome. He enlists in the Pope's Zouave Army. And in 1867, he is discovered through another uh, Roman Catholic who reveals the truth about it. And uh, he is then brought back to the United States and put on trial. He has two trials. And because Roman Catholics have more allegiance to their priests and the canon law than they do our, our country, when a Roman Catholic's on a jury, they can hang a jury and, and let the murderer go free. And that's exactly what happened to John Sir. As a result of the Surratt affair, and the papal policy of not allowing Protestant churches within the city of Rome, the United States of America ended diplomatic relations with the Vatican in 1867. But even with the end of diplomatic relations with the U.S., the Jesuits had achieved a great victory. First, hundreds of thousands of Protestants were dead. Second, much of the Protestant South lay in ruins. Third, Forcing the South at gunpoint to stay in the Union had dealt a severe blow to the Constitution and the concept of freedom. And lastly, Lincoln was dead and the Jesuits were avenged for his interference in the Chinoquee trial and his attempt to restore the Republic to its pre-war state. Adding insult to this situation, the Jesuit-controlled radical Republicans in Congress, men like Charles Sumner, and Thaddeus Stevens were able to pass the 14th Amendment in 1868. The 14th Amendment created a new type of citizen, a citizen of the United States. Whereas before, a man was a citizen of the state in which he was born, citizenship was now at the national level. Ostensibly, this new citizenship was created to help the freed slaves, but in reality, it was a measure that would allow the federal government to strip away constitutional rights from the people and replace those rights with privileges granted by the government. In Maxwell versus Dow of 1899, the Supreme Court said that none of the Bill of Rights are privileges and immunities of 14th Amendment U.S. citizenship. And the great dissent by John Marshall Harlan, the first Harlan, must be read by every viewer as he goes out of his chair to say that we don't enjoy real liberty. That our rights of American freemen have been overthrown. That our Anglo-Saxon liberties are gone. And then he reiterates in 1908 in Twining v. New Jersey, when Twining v. New Jersey comes out and says, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Seventh Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, none of those amendments are privileges and immunities of United States citizenship under the Fourteenth Amendment. That's why in court you take your Fifth Amendment privilege. That's why you, you own a gun with a privilege. That's why you worship God now by a privilege granted from Washington. This ought to make us irate. All we have is Soviet citizenship, but all of us are. Whites and blacks were all slaves of the Jesuits from Washington, D.C., and we, none of us have any absolute rights to limit the powers of Washington. The only thing that limits Washington's powers is the decisions of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's controlled by the Jesuits of Georgetown. You got five Roman Catholics sitting on it now. But why was it so important to the Jesuits to create a nation? In his book, A Constitutional View of the Law of the Late War Between the States, Alexander Stevens tells us why. In Volume 2, Alexander Stevens tells us on page 650 the real reason of the 14th Amendment. Quote, Consolidation and Empire. That's the purpose of the amendment. Consolidation of the states and empire. That's why I call it 
the Pope's Holy Roman 14th Amendment corporate fascist socialist communist empire created by this 14th Amendment. He goes on and says, They have not as yet openly denied the federative character of the government. However, in direct war upon its principles, their acts have been covertly aimed. This is an exceedingly important fact to be specifically noted and kept in mind. These monstrous reconstruction measures, with all their enormities and fatal tendencies towards ultimate complete centralism and empire, are still based upon the assumption that the states, as separate integral parts, constitute members of what is still, in words at least, acknowledged to be a federal union. All these bold usurpations of power are, upon their face, nothing but resorts to induce or to compel under duress the peoples of the several southern states to go through the forms of adopting the 14th Amendment as an additional article to the Constitution. So, he then concludes, No system of representative government can be long maintained by any people who have not the intelligence to understand it, the patriotism to approve it, and the virtue to maintain and violate both its form and principles as established. So this is the reason for the 14th Amendment. Consolidation and empire. And this is what Andrew Johnson understood was the purpose, and so he campaigned against it. And he called Lee a hero if that was the real reason for this war, to keep this consolidation and empire from being formed. The 14th Amendment was proclaimed ratified on July 28, 1868. That was the end of the Washington's Republic as established in 1787. So our white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant and Baptist Calvinist Federal Republic of these United States lasted from 1787 to 1868. And a new nation was established in 1868, and that is called the, uh, the American Empire in my book, and it has existed from 1868 to the present, and it is squarely in the hands of the papacy for two reasons. For destroying heretics, liberals, perfidious Jews, and infidel Muslims and, and Buddhists, over the last hundred years since the Spanish-American War, or since really the Indian War of the Great Plains. The War of the Great Plains from 1860 to 1890 was the annihilation of the Native American Indians so that they could build an empire from sea to shining sea. A terrible crime. And it was all led by uh, a Roman Catholic army general named Philip Sheridan who was advised by the America's most powerful Western Jesuit at the time, Pierre de Schmitt, and it was as Philip Sheridan who said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. With the 14th Amendment, the Constitution of the Founding Fathers was tossed into the dustbin of history, and centralization of power in Washington, D.C. was well underway. Now the American Empire could begin in earnest. The American states, both in the North and South, would be subservient to the federal government and would be essentially slaves to this new master. In rapid succession, the United States found itself in one war after another. The Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, Gulf War I, Gulf War II, and a host of smaller police actions, such as in Somalia, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Libya. Looking over the last 150 years, one can discern the influence of the Jesuits in the initiation of these wars and conflicts for the purpose of building a world empire under their control. Early in the 20th century, the Jesuits were determined to start a new European war. Germany expelled the Jesuits in 1872. Russia had expelled the Jesuits in 1820. France had expelled the Jesuits in 1880. Britain had formally, although not in actuality, had formally expelled the Jesuits in 1829. Every country in Europe, Switzerland, 1848, every country in Europe had expelled the Jesuits except Belgium. And so the Jesuits said, well now, we're going to have to punish these people because they obviously didn't learn the lesson with Napoleon Bonaparte. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Britain and we're going to use America and we're going to have a second 30 years war. The first one was from 1618 to 1648. 
The second one's going to be from 1914 to 1945. We're going to have World War I. We're going to have the Bolshevik Revolution. We're going to have the Spanish Civil War. We're going to have World War II. We're going to just have continual war for 30 years. And we're going to control all the factions. We're going to control the Allies and we're going to control the Axis. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the spark that ignited the First World War. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian throne. His inclusive policy towards the Slavic peoples and lenient treatment of Orthodox Christian Serbia made him unacceptable to Rome. He therefore could not be allowed to rule. The assassination was set for July 26, 1914. Since the year 1054, the Catholic Church has been waging war against Orthodox Christians. The Orthodox Christians did not accept the supremacy of the Pope. A war involving the major powers of Europe would be a perfect opportunity to have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Orthodox Serbs and Russians killed. Afterwards, Rome would be in a better position to dominate these countries. Who shot the Archduke? Gavrilo Princip, a member of the secret society called the Black Hand. The Black Hand was founded by Freemasons. During the trial, Princep testified that his colleague, Zaganovich, told me he was a Freemason, and on another occasion told me that the heir apparent, Franz Ferdinand, had been condemned to death by a Freemason's lodge. Even though a Masonic group carried out the murder, all of Serbia was blamed. It was never pointed out at that time that the assassins were linked to Freemasonry and that its upper levels had been under the control of the Jesuits for nearly a century. After World War I, a movement was put in motion to have a world government that would help the nations of the world live in peace, a peace controlled by the Jesuits. When this world government, or League of Nations failed to materialize, the Jesuits pushed forward plans to create a second world war. Even before the end of World War I, the Jesuits had set in motion a plan to bring the Russian Orthodox Christians back into the fold of the Pope's control. Under the direction of their superior general, Vladimir Ledovchowski, the Jesuits instigated the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. This revolution brought communism to Russia. The Jesuits had been thrown out of Russia over a hundred years earlier, but now the leader of the Bolsheviks, Vladimir Lenin, admitted the Jesuits back into Russia in 1922. Lenin proved fickle and showed signs of disloyalty to the Jesuits. For this, he was poisoned, and his replacement, Joseph Stalin, was ready to carry on with the Vatican's bidding. As a boy, Stalin had obtained a scholarship to attend Tiflis Theological Seminary. Openly, the school was Orthodox Christianity, but behind the scene, it was run by the Jesuits. In 1931, Stalin was interviewed by Emil Ludwig. Ludwig, do you not admit that the Jesuits have good points? Stalin, yes, they are systematic and persevering in working to achieve sordid ends, but their principal method is spying, prying, worming their way into people's souls and outraging their feelings. Once in power, Stalin killed millions of people, both Jews and Orthodox Christians. He killed anyone who would resist the new Soviet state he created based on Marxism. What many failed to understand was that Marxism was based on the Jesuit slave plantations or reducciones in South America and Sir Thomas More's book, Utopia. What the Jesuits did was, is they were the masters of communism. Communism originates with the Roman Catholic traitor whose name was Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More betrayed King Henry VIII, gave his full allegiance to the Pope, and for which reason Thomas More was executed as a traitor, um, holding forth the Pope's temporal power over his allegiance to his king. Uh, Sir Thomas More is the author of Utopia. Utopia is the foundation for communism. So communism is Romanism. In fact, the orders, uh, the many communities of the Roman Catholic institution, uh, the Jesuit order, the Redemptorist, uh, uh, that the, the goes on and on, they run on communist principles of universal equality. Communist is a Latin term. So therefore, communism is a brainchild of the Jesuits 
but it has been made to look Jewish through implementing it through Marx and his Communist Manifesto, financed also by another Masonic British Freemason, um, Engels. Besides establishing communism in Russia after World War I, the Jesuits sought to re-establish the Pope's physical kingdom that had been taken from him in 1871. On June 7, 1929, the Lateran Treaty was ratified, which re-established the Pope's domain called Vatican City. The new Prime Minister of Italy, Benito Mussolini, was instrumental in bringing about the treaty. The treaty occurred only a few months before the economic crash that started in America and quickly spread around the world called the Great Depression. Approximately 90 million dollars worth of gold in, in lira, I think it was about a billion worth of lira, something like that, was given to the papacy by the Italian government. So the, for reparations, for lack of a better word, because that we had been suppressed from 1870 to 1929, you owe us all this money. So, Benito Mussolini enslaves the Italian Catholic people, makes them pay this huge sum, which they didn't want to pay. And what does the papacy do with this money? Well, this treaty is in about February or March. In October, the Jesuits crashed the American stock market, and they used their their number one short seller, the Irish Roman Catholic, Joseph P. Kennedy, to do it. So they sell short, the margin calls can't be met, the stock market crashes, and what happens? The Vatican takes their millions of dollars that they got from Mussolini, and they invest it in all the corporations and businesses that are busted on Wall Street, and they buy it all for pennies. So by the time Wall Street comes back into power, the Archbishop of New York completely controls all the major corporations in this country. As banks began to fail, the Federal Reserve did not act to pump money into the system, which it should have done had those in control of it wanted to keep the banks afloat. As the chaos lingered and many lost their jobs and were driven into poverty, the Jesuits created a dictatorship out of the office of the President of the United States. In March 1933, the new President, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, signed into law a state of national emergency. Under such a state of emergency, the Constitution was set aside, ostensibly for the public good, until the emergency was canceled by the President. Roosevelt never canceled the emergency. This was verified in 1973 by the Church Matthias Committee and published in Senate Report 93-549. No American president since then has canceled the emergency. And even though Congress passed the National Emergency Termination Act in 1974, this termination was in name only. The reality was that the emergency powers taken were never returned. They continued in the U.S. Code as permanent powers. Thus, we are currently in a state of emergency or dictatorship. It should also be noted that Roosevelt was a 32nd degree Freemason. FDR was obliged to follow the orders of the head of this secret society. His oath to Freemasonry superseded his oath to the U.S. Constitution. And as we have seen, the man in control of Freemasonry was the Jesuit Superior General. In Germany, the Vatican had in place Adolf Hitler. It is usually not emphasized, but Hitler was a Roman Catholic. Hitler praised the Roman Catholic Church, saying that, until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's head of the SS, was also a Roman Catholic. Frederick Hoffett wrote, Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, and most members of the party's old guard were Catholics. After the war, Walter Schellenberg, former head of German counter-espionage, stated, the SS organization had been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Himmler's title as supreme commander of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits general. Incredibly, although he killed and tortured millions, the Vatican never excommunicated Hitler. In fact, not one of the mass murderers of the Third Reich was ever excommunicated by the Vatican. 
The day Hitler died, the Spanish dictator Franco, also a Roman Catholic, had this statement run in the publication Reforma. Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. As a loyal son, Hitler killed heretics, including Protestants, Jews, Orthodox Christians, and even liberal Catholics. All told, the war dead numbered between 62 to 78 million people. 11 million of the total dead from World War II died in concentration camps, 6 million being Jews. The Jewish Holocaust was never condemned by Pope Pius XII, or for that matter, by any other pope. Why this silence? The Jews, like all heretics, resisted conversion to Roman Catholicism and obedience to the Pope. Who financed Hitler? The answer is clear and easily verified. The Vatican and many of the wealthy elite in the West gave Hitler the money he needed to build the Third Reich. As early as 1919, Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli met a young Adolf Hitler in Munich. The meeting occurred at night while all the household was asleep, except for the nun who attended Archbishop Pacelli. Her name was Pascalina. According to Pascalina, Hitler told Pacelli that he was out to check the spread of aesthetic communism in Munich and elsewhere. It did not come as a surprise to her, therefore, in light of Pacelli's hatred of the Reds, to see the prelate present Hitler with a large cache of church money to aid the rising revolutionary and his small struggling band of anti-communists. Go quell the devil's work. Help spread the love of Almighty God, Pacelli told Hitler. For the love of Almighty God, she heard the young man, Adolf Hitler, reply. Money for this young revolutionary also came from industrialists in the West. Hitler's rise to power was financed by London and New York and Berlin. They were the Knights of Malta running the banking institutions of the world. In the discipline of historical research, one of the greatest taboo subjects is to look into who financed Hitler. The answer is clear and easily verified. The Vatican and many of the wealthy elite in the West gave Hitler the money he needed to build the Third Reich. Many do not realize that Prescott Bush, the grandfather of President George W. Bush, and George Herbert Walker, the maternal great-grandfather of President George W. Bush, were Nazi collaborators. Along with Avril Harriman, they set up Union Banking Corporation as a complex money laundering operation for a number of Nazi front businesses. Documents at the National Archives and the Library of Congress show conclusively that Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker should have been tried for treason because their Nazi dealings continued after the U.S. entered World War II. They had continued to do business with their primary Nazi patron, who was Fritz Thiessen, who backed Hitler beginning in 1921 and who was the wealthiest man in Germany, and a steel and coal baron who, with his partner Friedrich Flick, essentially built the Nazi war machine along with I.G. Farben. In 1951, when uh, Fritz Thiessen died in Argentina, Union Banking Corporation was liquidated by the U.S. government and Prescott Bush received 1.5 million dollars for his holdings in his Nazi business and that was the beginning of the Bush family fortune for all intents and purposes. George Bush doesn't take his philosophical foundation from the Bible or the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. George Bush takes his inspiration from what he learned in Skull and Bones and from the Thule Society that Hitler and Goebbels and Goring cut their teeth in. Bohemian Grove, these evil organizations that perpetrate the ugly things that these criminals are doing to this country for which they must be held accountable. The Jesuits created the Illuminati in 1776. The American branch of the Illuminati was called Skull and Bones and has its headquarters at CIA recruiting ground, Yale University. Prescott Bush was a member, as was his son and grandson, President George W. Bush. It is interesting that in the 2004 presidential election, two Skull and Bones members ran against each other. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? 
The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the website. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? Secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction. It is evident that the Bush family and others are under, and have been under, the control of the Jesuits for decades. Most people are familiar with Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. However, it may surprise many that Hitler did not write the book. Adolf Hitler was not a writer. Adolf Hitler was a newspaper reader. According to Kurt Kruger's great book, I Was Hitler's Doctor, it was published in 1934, he said that Hitler's lair was just filled with old newspapers, that that's all he ever did was read, these old newspapers. He was not a writer. He was not a student of history. He was not a student of culture. If you read Mein Kampf, whoever wrote it knew the cultures of many different countries over many different centuries. They knew all about pol political practices. The writers of Mein Kampf were brilliant. And Mein Kampf, according to Leo Lehman, who was an Irish Roman Catholic priest, who wrote Behind the Dictators in 1942, said that Father Bernard Stamfel was the real author of Mein Kampf. Adolf Hitler was created to be an instrument of the Jesuits, and like Napoleon, Hitler served his creator well. Millions of the Vatican's enemies were dead, and America forgot George Washington's warnings and abandoned its policy of isolationism. During World War II, the Vatican targeted the Orthodox Christians in Croatia for destruction. As in World War I, the Orthodox Serbians of Croatia suffered again in World War II. A campaign of terror and murder was inflicted on the Serbs by the Croatian Ustace regime. The leader of the Ustace was Ante Pavelic, a Roman Catholic. Pavelic and the Ustace murdered around 500,000 people, while 250,000 were expelled and another 200,000 were forced to convert to Catholicism. Like the Jewish Holocaust, Pope Pius XII never condemned these atrocities, nor has any pope since then condemned them. Once the war had concluded, the Vatican helped former Nazis escape Germany to safe havens in South America. They even helped Ustasi leader Pavelic escape to Argentina. Pope Pius XII was the pope who saved hundreds of thousands of Europe's Nazis who passed through Vatican monasteries uh, Dominican, Benedictine, and Jesuit, uh, where they were given shelter, new identities, new passports, sent largely to South America, but there were plenty uh, sent elsewhere, including to the United States, where there was even a program to get the good ones out, Operation Paperclip, which is well known, but Canada let in. And I, I, I know this, uh, Mackenzie King let in tons of Nazis who passed through the Vatican monasteries. And this Pope Pius XII could, Im it's impossible he didn't know about that. After World War II, a conflict began between the Western powers, mainly the US and Britain, and those of the East, the Soviets and the Chinese. It came to be called the Cold War. From its beginning, the Cold War was a way of keeping the world in chaos and fear pitting the Christian nations against the communist nations. And most importantly, a way to keep the spotlight off the Vatican. Many people knew of Rome's backing of the Catholic dictators of Europe. They also knew of Rome's aid in helping many of them to escape. The Vatican had not been punished for these crimes. In fact, Pope Pius XII should have stood before the judges at Nuremberg. The Jesuits used the Cold War as an effective diversion for Rome. It worked like a charm. To get it started, a rock in the road had to be removed. That rock was General George S. Patton. 
At the end of World War II, General George Patton wanted to attack the Soviet Union. Patton saw the menace to the free world communism was and wanted to go ahead and end it. Patton's conversation to General McNarney in 1945 was revealing. Why do you care what these goddamn Russians think? We are going to have to fight them sooner or later. Why not do it now while our army is intact and the damn Russians can have their hind end kicked back into Russia in three months? The Jesuits could not allow the Soviet Union to be destroyed. As Robert Wilcox lays out in his book, Target Patent, Roman Catholic William Donovan, head of the OSS, arranged for the assassination of Patton. Patton had survived three previous attempts on his life. He also survived the fourth, but was hospitalized. While in the hospital, a refined form of cyanide was given to him that can cause or appear to cause embolisms and heart failure. After making preparations to leave the hospital, Patton's health took a sudden turn for the worse, and he died. The result was that the Jesuits got their Cold War. During the Cold War, the activity of two U.S. presidents, John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan, reveals much about the power of the Jesuits. John Kennedy was a Roman Catholic who turned against the Vatican and the Jesuits. Kennedy decided to be his own man, take his own counsel, and not take orders from Rome. He turned out to be a liberal Catholic, which is just as obnoxious to the Vatican as a Protestant or any heretic. Kennedy began to pull out of Vietnam. He ordered the Treasury Department to print money and not go through the privately held Federal Reserve. And he had plans for a new invasion of Cuba. See, Kennedy wanted Cuba back from Castro. The big lie is that Kennedy, he was, he canceled the orders. He didn't cancel the orders. McGeorge Bundy canceled the order for the air cover in the Bay of Pigs. That's according to Fletcher Prouty in his book, JFK. And on the, um, on the USS Essex, which was a aircraft carrier there, that the captain was told not to give any air cover to the invading uh, uh, patriots there in Cuba. But that cover was canceled, not by JFK, because the night before he said he gave a go-ahead. And to prove this point, there's a book that's been released about a year ago called Ultimate Sacrifice, written by Waldron. And in that book, it shows that JFK had planned to invade Cuba on December 1st, 1963, and get rid of that Jesuit, Fidel Castro. On November 22nd, he was killed even nine days before the invasion was to take place. Like the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy's assassination was meticulously planned and executed with Lee Harvey Oswald as the patsy. But you see, Gene Hill with Mary Mormon were right there at the limousine. And Gene Hill and Mary Mormon said that the driver turned around and shot. But they thought the driver was shooting back at the shooter. They didn't know the driver was shooting JFK in the head, along with the storm drain shooter, at a simultaneous headshot. That shot from the grassy knoll was a distraction. They had a smoke. I mean, we've had smokeless gunpowder since the turn of the century. I mean, why would they use a rifle and have smoke? It was a distraction for the crowd to run to the grassy knoll because the real shooters was the storm drain shooter and the driver shooting Kennedy in the head simultaneously. And I show in my book, Kennedy was shot five times. The assassination was done in a very public way to show other would-be presidents what would happen if orders were not followed. The assassination of John F. Kennedy is done in broad daylight as a warning to all the other leaders of the world. But it's also done with this viciousness. Because you see, JFK was a Catholic. And they wanted to kill their Catholic boy who refused to uphold the temporal power of the Pope. And so they killed him viciously and cruelly, just as a warning to any other Catholic who would dare trammel the temporal power of the Pope. In contrast to Kennedy, Ronald Reagan did everything he could to court Vatican approval after an assassination attempt on his life in 1981. Well, Ronald Reagan 
was advocating some things that would have built the middle class that were generally pretty good. He was talking like a conservative. Evidently, he thought for a few minutes he was the president because he'd been told to choose George Bush as a vice presidential candidate. And all, the, and all the conservatives said, how could you do this to us? And yet he's still, quote unquote, elected. So Reagan starts to advocate some pretty good things. And so we're going to punish you, Ronnie. And so they carried out the attempted assassination. If he survives, he'll do what we're told, what he's told. If he doesn't survive, well, then George Bush will openly take his place and be the president. Either way, we win. So Jerry Parr, the Secret Service agent, shoots Reagan inside the vehicle and makes it look like Hinckley is the one who shot him. Hinckley did not shoot Reagan. He was, Reagan was untouched when he, at the time he was entering this, the limousine. He was shot inside the limousine by a Secret Service agent. And uh, then, phenomenally enough, a, a Jewish doctor saved his life. So uh, Bush was a part of this, of course. He uh, was not openly made the president, but he was secretly the president during the entire uh, two terms of Ronald Reagan. President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy because no other president has come as close as President Reagan with the Vatican and even uh, uh, not even John F. Kennedy. What that means is they have done to President Kennedy and to President Reagan what they were not able to do even through a Roman Catholic president. In 1984, Reagan established diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Not since 1867 had there been any official contact between the two countries. That relationship was formally restored by the worst president America has ever been disgraced with our greatest traitor, Ronald Reagan. When he restored diplomatic relationships with the Vatican, formally recognized the sovereign state of Vatican City as a nation, and now America can enter into a concordat with the Pope as warned by ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera for many years. Ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera also revealed a secret concerning the inauguration of Ronald Reagan that some noted at the time, but few fully understood. Alberto Rivera made a startling statement in which he said there would be a sign given to Jesuits throughout the world when all churches would be taken over by the Jesuit order. The sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. After Reagan's presidential reign, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and the Cold War ended. However, instead of greater freedom, nations around the world found their governments becoming more repressive. Terrorism became the new foe, and the United States and other Western governments pledged to fight this new enemy at all cost. That included taking away all God-given rights from the people in order to bring about supposed peace and safety. In America and elsewhere, many noted that the government knew about the terrorist attacks in advance, but failed to stop them. In fact, it is now painfully obvious that the government allowed these attacks to occur. Unfortunately, the American people find themselves in the same situation and making the same mistake that the Southern people made before the war between the states. In the 1800s, the South, like the North, had Jesuit-controlled Freemasons and coadjutors in key religious, political, and military positions. Many newspapers were also under Rome's control. These men and media outlets created the agitation towards war. As the slave issue escalated, pushing the South towards secession, the Southern people fully expected God to be on their side. However, like America today, the people of the South failed to understand they were not on God's side. The South did not practice biblically sanctioned slavery.
The Bible authorizes two types of slavery. A voluntary servitude to pay off debt and slavery as a result of war. The South did not practice these types of slavery. The South practiced man-stealing or kidnapping for profit. Exodus 21.16 clearly states, And he that stealeth a man, and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. For their sin and refusal to repent of man-stealing, the South reaped a harvest of death and destruction. Likewise, America today is finding itself in the same situation. Instead of asking God why he did not protect them from the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, Americans were easily manipulated with pride and cried out for vengeance against a foreign enemy. A vengeance that brought multi-billion dollar profits to the death industries by promoting endless war. Instead of asking God what they had done to offend him and lose their blessed state, the American people are seeking answers and solutions from politicians, false prophets, and economic wizards. For the most part, the American people do not see a correlation between turning their backs on the God of the Bible and the disasters that have come down upon them. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Jesuits decided to implement their plans to create a central bank in the United States. Their plan would enable them to pay for the wars that were coming as the American empire expanded. Once this was accomplished, the common man would hold worthless paper and the Jesuits would be in a position to fund new wars using the U.S. military as its muscle. The Jesuits in their counter-reformation have set out to destroy the Protestant Reformation, which had a middle class and private rights and private wealth and private land ownership and in their attempt to bring the world back to the dark ages the 13th century when Pope Clement, Pope Innocent III was the was the demon Pope of all of Europe at the time set out to destroy the Abigenses and others to do this to destroy Western Protestant civilization they had to implement the pillars of the Communist Manifesto well two of those pillars are these the national credit would be in the hands of the federal government so therefore, the, net, the credit of this country is in the federal government as extended to, by the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a private bank. Lewis versus U.S. tells us this in the federal case. So this private Federal Reserve Bank, which is controlled by the Vatican through its various orders, particularly the old crusading orders like the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templars, which are today high-level Freemasons, they have put upon us this horrible Federal Reserve Bank, which is a Pope's bank, to finance all the Pope's crusades since no later than the Spanish-American War of 1898 to the present. In order to create the central bank, certain obstacles had to be overcome. First, those opposed to a central bank would need to be removed, and secondly, the law would need to be changed, or simply appear to be changed. To deal with the troublesome individuals who opposed a central bank, the Jesuits spared no expense. They built a ship of death called the Titanic. The sinking of the Titanic was a design of the Jesuit order to get rid of <clears throat> uh, the opposition to the creation of a central bank in the United States. And the men on the Titanic were opposed to a central bank. They had to die. Among those were John Jacob Astor, Isidore Strauss, Benjamin Guggenheim, and a host of other millionaires who were opposed to a central bank in America. Therefore, they had to be taken out of the way, and they were on the Titanic. The company building the ship was owned by J.P. Morgan, who was himself an agent of the Rothschilds family, the Rothschilds being the bankers for the Pope and the Vatican. The main Jesuit targets were brought on board. The captain of the ship was Edward John Smith. It appears from his actions that Captain Smith was a Jesuit coadjutor, that is, a Jesuit who has taken the oath but does not wear the robes. 
a coadjutor blends into the scenery and never looks like a Jesuit priest. It is a veteran sea captain, Edward Smith, who orders the ship to travel through an 80 square mile ice field at full speed on a moonless night. There had been over eight telegrams warning the captain of the danger. He's warned eight times, slow the ship down, slow the Titanic down, you're going too fast. Not once stopped. Knew there was an ice, you know, iceberg field up ahead. Knew that he should have slowed down, but didn't. And so you look and you say, how was it that this man could go headlong into a field of icebergs and not slow the ship down, not be more careful. The only way you can, the only conclusion you can draw is as a coadjutor of the Jesuit order, right through the line, the chain of command, he was told, sink the ship. And he did. On board the Titanic, and this is all documented in a National Geographic video that was put out in 1986. You can go to your local library and they'll either have it on hand or they can you know, get it on library loan. But on that videotape, it shows that as the Titanic was coming up along the coast of, of England, it had various stops. And at one stop, a Jesuit priest got on board. His name was Francis Brown. Francis Brown got on board the Titanic, took pictures of all of the wealthy people, took pictures of Edward Smith, the captain, and then just before the Titanic set sail across the Atlantic, Francis Brown got off. And then, of course, the Titanic sunk. Well, Francis Brown is given a camera by his bishop, by his uncle, the bishop, and he is told to go down and take all these pictures of all these people who are going to kill in first class. And so that's what he does. He takes picture of, of all these rich people, everybody that there is, that there is going to go down, and a rich passenger offers him passage. Well, he knows the ship's going to go down, but he, he very sheepishly got in contact with his provincial and the provincial's message was, get off that ship. Like Brown, another noted passenger, Jesuit agent J.P. Morgan, did not make the ill-fated sea voyage. Even though booked on the ship for passage to America, Morgan also fortuitously canceled at the last minute. Of course, J.P. Morgan, he had, a, he had his own suite reserved for him. And there were some 55 men who at the last minute canceled their reservations on the Titanic. J.P. Morgan was one of them, said he was sick. Oh, by the way, and don't load any of my art treasures on the Titanic either. So he didn't have any of his art treasures on it either. Didn't lose any of that. How do we know there was foul play involved with the Titanic? When the iceberg was sighted, it was First Officer Murdoch who attempted to port around the deadly object. This was sound enough, but Murdoch also ordered the engines into reverse. Author Wynn Wade asked the obvious question. As long as Murdoch was trying to veer out of the iceberg's way, why had he jammed on the brakes, so to speak, by throwing the engines full speed astern? In point of fact, the 1910 edition of Knight's Modern Seamanship clearly contradicted Murdoch's decision. The instructions are clear. Avoid reversing the engines. Wade sums up the situation by saying, Murdoch had maneuvered in a manner more likely to cause collisions than to prevent them. As with many who investigated the Titanic disaster, author Wynne Wade was at a loss to explain Murdoch's actions in going against the book. But the captain and Murdoch's actions were not the only telltale signs of treachery on the night the Titanic sank. We see all sorts of anomalies in the Titanic. For example, when it was sinking, the emergency flares were to be red so that ships in those lanes could see the Titanic was in trouble. Well, someone had taken away the red flares and replaced them with white flares, making it look like we were shooting off flares and having a party. 
And then the loading of the boats, we know that was a fraud. They would not, they didn't allow the lifeboats to be completely loaded. They were only half loaded, some one third loaded because the targets in the first class could not be allowed to board. And the Jesuits were not only the captain, but his officers, and there had been a strike in England at the time, and the men who were normally the ones who would man the ocean liners, they were replaced by Jesuit coadjutors ready to board because they were all under oath to die for the Black Pope if necessary. And so they did carry out the sinking of the Titanic. But how is it possible that men will commit suicide as Captain Smith and some of his hand-picked crew obviously did? We have to understand that these men have died to their own self-will. And so they have completely been emptied of their own personalities and upon the order of their commander will do exactly what they're told there's no such thing as a disobedient Jesuit. This serves as a warning to all the other men of power, not only in our country, but in England and Europe. You mess with us, and we're going to do to you what we did to all those people in Titanic, and we're going to thwart the investigation, because a subsequent investigation of the sinking of Titanic blamed Bruce Ismay, the right-hand man of J.P. Morgan, and, and Captain Lord of England. They were the scapegoats when they could have easily blamed the men of power at that time. Saw who canceled their reservations. It was, all in, it was a Warren Commission all over again. 9-11 Commission all over again. It's a whitewash and cover-up. And that cover-up is even more powerful than the murder itself. After many of the leading opponents to a central bank had been removed, the Jesuits moved to obtain passage of the 16th Amendment and the Federal Reserve Act both in 1913. So they created the Federal Reserve Bank to finance their crusades. Without the Federal Reserve Bank, there's no war in Iraq. Without the Federal Reserve Bank, there's no World War II. There's no World War I. And there's a book written by Katz called The Money Changers, and in it he says that it's the Federal Reserve Bank and the creators of all this paper currency, fiat money, um, credit out of thin air. Without that, you don't have these wars. So, they needed the Federal Reserve Bank to create wars on heretic and liberal peoples in Europe so that they could restore the Pope's temporal power throughout the European nations that was being thrown off in the 1800s. Besides instigating wars and controlling the banking industry, the Jesuits have spent a great deal of time and effort attacking and undermining their number one enemy, the Bible, specifically the King James Bible. As stated in Leone's The Secret Plan, the Jesuits view the Bible as a serpent that must be made into a harmless rod. In an effort to undermine the validity of the Bible, especially the book of Genesis, the Jesuits promoted Charles Darwin's unproven theory of evolution. Evolution theory postulates that man evolved or came about by chance. There was no God or divine agent at work in creating the world. All life had simply developed over time by mutations from a single cell that was formed billions of years ago. Supposedly, man himself had evolved from primitive ape-like creatures to his present state. When the evolutionary theory needed proof of its validity, a young Jesuit priest by the name of Pierre Tehard de Chardin appeared on the scene. In 1912, Tehard assisted Charles Dawson at the digs in England where the Piltdown Man was discovered. This so-called missing link convinced most of the world that mankind had evolved from more ape-like creatures. It was not until 40 years later that the Piltdown Man was discovered to be a hoax. Philip Johnson, in his book, Darwin on Trial, has this to say. Many persons familiar with the evidence, including Stephen Jay Gould and Louis Leakey, have concluded that Tehard de Chardin was probably culpably involved in preparing the Piltdown fraud. By the time Piltdown Man was exposed, a generation had been indoctrinated into the belief that the evolutionary theory had a solid foundation in science. The truth of the matter is that the evolutionary theory is questionable or bad science with no solid foundations in truth. To 
illustrate this fact, let's look at an exchange between author Luther Sunderland and Dr. Colin Patterson. Luther Sunderland was a creationist author and exponent. In 1978, Dr. Patterson, a senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History in London, published a book entitled Evolution. Sunderland wrote to Dr. Patterson and asked why the preeminent evolutionist had not included any pictures of transitional fossils in his book. Dr. Patterson candidly replied, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustrations of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. You suggest that an artist should be used to visualize such transformations, but where would he get the information from? I could not, honestly, provide it, and if I were to leave it to artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? Like a bombshell, this statement by Dr. Patterson hit the evolutionary world and enraged it. Patterson sought to pacify his evolutionary colleagues, but he never recanted. To those who had a modicum of common sense, it was evident that the evolutionary emperor was not wearing any clothes. Evolution was just a theory that had no hard evidence to back it up. In his 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box, Dr. Michael Behay made this rather pointed observation. In the face of the enormous complexity that modern biochemistry has uncovered in the cell, the scientific community is paralyzed. No one at Harvard University, no one at the National Institutes of Health, no member of the National Academy of Sciences, no Nobel Prize winner, no one at all can give a detailed account of how the cilium or vision or blood clotting or any complex biochemical process might have developed in a Darwinian fashion. But in spite of this and other overwhelming evidence that the evolutionary theory had no foundation in fact, the Vatican came out with an extraordinary statement. On October 22nd, 1996, the same year as Behe's book, Pope John Paul II issued a statement to the Pontifical Academy in which he said, New knowledge has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than hypothesis. This endorsement of evolution showed the true nature of the Vatican. The God of the Bible had to be denied and relegated to the past. The Jesuit plan to cast doubt on the Bible as God's word of truth had come a long way. But Darwin's theory of evolution was not their greatest achievement in undermining biblical authority. The Jesuits set in motion an attack on the original Greek text of the Bible. The New Testament was written in Greek. For over 1900 years, the Greek text of the scriptures had endured and come down to us as it was read by the first Christians. To be sure, we now only have copies of copies of the originals, but the text has remained the same. Today, there are 5,686 Greek New Testament manuscripts in existence. Of these manuscripts, the majority, over 90%, have been used over the centuries as a basis for the text of the New Testament. This majority text came out of Antioch in Syria. Antioch became the headquarters for Christians of the first century, and the majority text is often referred to as the Antiochian text but the authoritative line of manuscripts is more often called the Textus Receptus, or Received Text. The King James Version is based on the Received Text. In the past, there have been attempts to alter the Received Text. A group of Gnostic Christians centered in Alexandria, Egypt, altered some manuscripts in the third century. The corrupted Alexandrian manuscripts downplayed the divinity of Jesus. The famous scholar Origen seems to have had a hand in this undertaking. However, the Christians of that time were not fooled. In the fourth century, another attempt to pass on these same corrupted manuscripts was led by the Roman Catholic scholar Jerome. Jerome made a translation of the Bible using the corrupted Alexandrian texts in 380 AD. Jerome called his translation the Vulgate, Jerome's new translation was promoted by Rome, and those who did not use it were persecuted. It was not until the Reformation that the uncorrupted received text was again used to translate God's word into the common language. 
The result was such translations as Luther's German New Testament of 1522, Tyndale's English New Testament of 1526, the Geneva Bible of 1560, and the King James Bible of 1611. Since 1611, the King James Bible supplanted other English translations to become the most revered and cherished translations of Protestant Christians throughout the world. Then, in the late 1800s, two men worked to change that. These two biblical scholars were Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. Westcott and Hort created a new critical text based on the theory that the New Testament was preserved almost perfectly in the two oldest manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. The Sinaiticus manuscript was discovered in 1844 in a Roman Catholic monastery. Facsimile copies of the Vaticanus manuscript were brought out of the Vatican Library in the late 1800s. Both of these manuscripts were from the corrupted Alexandrian line. Using these two manuscripts as a foundation, Westcott and Hort began to put together their Greek text of the New Testament in 1853. In 1881, they completed and published their work. According to Westcott and Hort, now for the first time, the true text of the New Testament was available to believers. Significantly, it is from the Westcott and Hort Greek text that many modern Bible translations have been produced. And what has been the effect of this change to those in the pews listening to the Word of God? With regard to John 1.18, we read in the King James Version, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The same verse in the New International Version, based on the Westcott Hort text, reads, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. Despite the somewhat confused rendering in the NIV, the change really amounts to altering only begotten Son to only begotten God. The appearance of this alteration in a small body of text originating from the veritable capital of Gnosticism, Alexandria, would suggest that the Gnostics made their mark in these texts and at this verse. Gnostics saw matter as evil and spirit as good. God was spirit and could not be involved with wicked matter or flesh, especially in the conception of a child. To Gnostics, the virgin birth was an impossibility. Another example of the corrupt influence of the Alexandrian manuscript was found in Acts 2.30. King David is spoken of in this verse as, Being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. The same verse in the New International Version, based on the Westcott Hort text, reads, But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. This is a clear-cut example of the removal of a biblical statement concerning the literal incarnation and physical descendants of Jesus Christ from David. This is in line with many Gnostic systems, which viewed Christ as a purely spiritual being an aeon emanating from the everlasting. The reading presented in the traditional text where Christ in the flesh is said to be in physical descendants from David would be antithetical to these speculative systems. There are many other examples that can be used to illustrate the point that the Westcott and Hort Greek text holds contrary views to the doctrines and teachings of the majority of the existing Greek manuscripts. Unfortunately, most Christians today are ignorant of this and still rely on the corrupt Westcott and Hort Greek text. Since they have had such an impact on the biblical text from which many modern translations come, it might be helpful to know more about Westcott and Hort. Supposedly, these men were Protestants. Specifically, they were Anglican or Church of England scholars. Moreover, Unlike what one would expect from a believer in the truth of the Word of God, Westcott did not believe that the first three chapters of Genesis should be taken literally. In a letter to Hort, Westcott stated, 
No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. Westcott also doubted the miracle stories in the Bible. He stated, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability. But even more telling is Westcott's devotion to John Henry Newman. Newman, along with several other Church of England clergymen, began the Oxford Movement in 1833. The purpose of this secret movement was to reunite the Church of England with the Roman Catholic Church. That same year, a clandestine meeting was held in Rome between John Henry Newman, Richard Froude, and Monsignor Wiseman. When asked what it would take for the Church of England to be accepted back into the Roman Catholic Church, Monsignor Wiseman answered, the Church of England must accept the Council of Trent in its entirety. Consider that. In 1833, the spokesman for the papacy brings up the acceptance of the Council of Trent as the main condition for reuniting with Rome. The Council of Trent met and declared 125 anathemas against the Protestant Reformation. The Pope and the Jesuits had not changed their minds then or to this day. For 12 years, Newman and his colleagues worked secretly to push the Church of England back into the arms of the papacy. When this secret society and its intentions were discovered, Newman and 150 followers defected to the Roman Church. It is apparent that Westcott was one of Newman's disciples who did not defect, but rather remained as a tool of Rome. Westcott's scholastic partner and pupil, Fenton John Anthony Hort, was no better in his biblical faith. Although Hort doubted the existence of a literal devil and of eternal punishment for the godless, he did believe in the Roman Catholic concept of purgatory. Hort stated that the idea of purgation, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us of the divine chastisements. Hort also adhered to the Roman Catholic teaching of baptismal regeneration. Hort stated, We maintain baptismal regeneration as the most important of doctrines. The pure Romish view seems to me nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. These false teachers work ceaselessly to undermine the King James Version of the Bible and install new Bible versions, more acceptable to the Vatican. Bible versions like the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the Living Bible, and the New International Version of the Bible. As mentioned earlier, the NIV is based on the Westcott Hort Greek text and its successor, the Nessel Alain Greek text. A Jesuit translator, Carlo Cardinal Martini, was on the translation committee for the NIV for this supposedly Protestant translation of the Bible. A representative of a group sworn to destroy Protestants sat on the committee that created a Protestant Bible. So, is this really a Protestant Bible? Once doubt had sufficiently been cast on the Bible and its veracity, the Jesuits knew the public would be less inclined to rise up in revolt as more open and drastic measures were taken to suppress the true Word of God. In the 1962 Ingle v. Vitale case, the U.S. Supreme Court voted that prayer in public school was unconstitutional. Why? Because it violated the First Amendment. Prayer in school had not violated the First Amendment for 175 years, but suddenly it did? The following year, in the case of Abington v. Shemp, the Supreme Court voted that the reading of the Bible was also a violation of the First Amendment. How did the Supreme Court arrive at these decisions? One only has to know that the Chief Justice of the Court, Earl Warren, was a Freemason to see why the Court voted as it did. And why did the President and Congress not impeach these Supreme Court justices and remove them from the Court? The answer is simple the President and Congress agreed with the decision. Otherwise, these godless justices would have been impeached and removed.
How did this happen? First, in the 1950s, churches began to incorporate and organize as tax-exempt organizations. Churches had always been tax-exempt, but now they could offer their congregations tax deductions for tithes and offerings. It was Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson who pushed for the churches to be added to the Section 501c3 of the tax code. For a 501c3 church to openly speak out or organize in opposition to anything that the government declares legal, even if it is completely immoral, the church will jeopardize its tax-exempt status. The 501c3 has had a chilling effect upon the free speech rights of the church. Another reason for the demise of the Protestant churches in America was that church pulpits and leadership had been infiltrated and subverted by Freemasons and Jesuit coadjutors. It was at this time, the late 50s and early 60s, that the Second Vatican Council met and set new goals for achieving old purposes. Vatican II fits right in harmony with the Council of Trent because what you have is at Trent, the Catholic Church said, we will not compromise with Protestantism. And so between Trent in the 1540s and Vatican II from 1958 to 1963, you have Jesuit infiltration of all the churches so that finally by 1958 to 1963, so there's been enough, enough infiltration done and enough of the messages of those churches have been watered down. So now Rome comes in with the ecumenical movement. That's what John the 23rd did at Vatican II. It was, let's bring all the churches together now, but it's not under Protestantism. It's not under biblical truth and principle. It's under Rome and it's under Roman tradition and Roman authority. That's all Vatican II was. So Vatican II fits right in harmony with uh, Alberto Rivera and his statement that all the churches by 1981 were completely taken over. What is the ultimate goal of the papacy? What is it that has not changed since the meetings in Vienna, Verona, and Chery in the early 1800s? The answer is domination of the world. The Vatican is seeking to create a one-world government or new world order. And what will be the capital of this world government? Not Rome, but Jerusalem. In 1993, the Italian newspaper La Stampa carried a curious article that said the Vatican had gained control of a portion of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. They want their capital back. The Crusades haven't ended. They've, they've done this before. It's not a new phenomenon here. What the Vatican wants is, Rome is their second capital. They want a crusade to liberate what they view as their actual physical capital. And that's where they don't want Jews in Jerusalem. What they're trying to do with this war now is take an eraser to all of these countries, right? Now you have no more countries. One massive trading block, right? In the middle of this, you've got a city that is revered big time. The papacy has wanted to move from Rome to Jerusalem ever since the fir very first crusade. They still want to do that. And how do we know this? We know this because a person named uh, Marc Halter, the French intellectual friend of Shimon Peres, uh, gave an interview in a now defunct magazine, uh, it's really the magazine, Shishi, where he said in May of 1993, I delivered a letter to the Pope, Shimon Peres, uh, promising the Vatican uh, East Jerusalem. And um, he gave a few details. Uh, East Jerusalem would be policed by the UN. The Vatican would get control of all holy sites of all religions. And um, the PLO would get a, a state within this enclave. Uh, the Vatican uh, gets the holy sites, and the UN gets to police the place. And now we've got two magazine confirmations. And Arafat agreed to this. According to the staff, three days before the signing, 
Declaration of Principles, Arafat agreed to the deal. And then when he didn't get the deal, uh, the terror started uh, uh, in earnest. If you do not bow down to the Jesuit-controlled Roman Catholic leader, you are a heretic, and you must die. These are the words of the celebrated St. Thomas Aquinas. On the part of the church, however, there is mercy which looks to the conversion of the wanderer, wherefore she condemns not at once, but after the first and second admonition, as the apostle directs. After that, if he is yet stubborn, the church, no longer hoping for his conversion, looks to the salvation of others by excommunicating him and separating him from the church, and furthermore delivers him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated thereby from the world by death. During the Chinoquy trial, Abraham Lincoln put Bishop Foley on the stand. The bishop was forced to admit that St. Thomas was looked upon as one of the highest authorities. In fact, the Roman Catholic bishop swore that God himself had inspired what St. Thomas had written about the manner in which heretics should be treated by the Roman Catholics. If the Vatican has its way, the future for all who speak out against the Pope or who do not go along with the goals of the Jesuits is one of torture and death. This has been the fate of many world leaders, including presidents in the United States. It has also been the fate of others in all walks of life, like Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, those against the Central Bank on the Titanic, ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera. In the Jesuit oath, the Jesuit states, I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. In light of all that has been exposed in this documentary, what is to be done? First and foremost, Christians should seek the Lord's guidance through daily prayer and Bible study we should pray for a new reformation, not a false revival, nor one that piggybacks on a political movement, or even one that tries to take control of the existing Antichrist, Republican, and Democrat parties, but rather a reformation that emphasizes the God of the Bible, a Bible based on the Textus Receptus, like the King James Version. Secondly, the Bible tells Christians to separate ourselves from evil. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And in the same chapter, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We should seek for a peaceful separation or secession from the American empire. We want to go back to a typical constitutional Protestant form of government that was isolationist. We kept our noses out of the businesses of other nations and we sought to develop our own country. George Bush has called the United States Constitution a GD piece of paper and he's called this present war a crusade, which it is. So it's all the more reason to secede. We're never going to get any relief. We need to have a move in every state for secession where we can begin to withdraw from Rome and the Potomac, which is Washington, and we can reestablish state national government once again and begin to govern our own affairs for what's best for that population or those populations in those states. And if we wish, we can then confederate together with other states, but we don't have to. Christians should not only avoid the poisons of this world, but also the false churches in the land. We should attend Bible-believing churches that are not incorporated and thus controlled by the government. If you cannot find a Bible-believing congregation in your area, start a house church yourself, with your family, or with other people in your community. Christians should shine light on the evil we see and speak out against it. In Ephesians we read, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Do not be timid, but speak out about what is clearly unbiblical and evil in this country. And finally, 
Be aware of deceivers and deceptions. Jesus warned of false prophets with lying tongues. In Matthew 24, verse 11, we read, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. As we move closer to the second coming of Christ, we should be vigilant and hold steadfast to the true faith as found in the scriptures, leaning on the Holy Spirit to empower us against false doctrine and wicked men. God's word does not tell us to make war on other countries, to bring them democracy, or to do nation building. These lies need to be denounced. The Jesuits will not stop in their quest for world dominion and the setting up of a new world order. Christians are to resist this antichrist system and be the light of the world. As the light shines, it reveals the truth, and the dark creatures of this world retreat from it.